in the city's consultant preparing the gateway area code. So we'll jump right into this. Um, just some Zoom logistics. I think we're all pros at this at this point. Um, we do ask that during the presentation that you mute your um, sound, um, but that when we go into the breakout rooms, uh, make sure you turn the mute off. And then if you can, to start your video um, for the breakout room discussion, if that's possible. Our Zoom host tonight is Jen Dart. So if you're having te technical difficulties, you can email Jen. I think there's also the opportunity to send us um, a chat as well, and we'll see that and that we can uh, uh, try to solve your problem if we can. So here's an agenda for the meeting tonight. Um, we have uh, no more than 30 minutes for an introductory presentation, um, hopefully a little bit less than that. Then we're gonna divide into breakout rooms to discuss the material tonight. Um, and then we'll leave the breakout rooms to reconvene together for a brief wrap up and be done um, in about an hour and a half. And so uh, tonight's virtual workshop is part of a larger process of enhanced outreach for the gateway code development process. And over the next four months, there will be three meeting series for different um, sets of gateway code topics. And for each of these three series, there will be a virtual workshop, there will be an online survey, and then a planning commission uh, work session. Uh, and so um, from all of this work, uh, we plan to release a complete public review draft gateway code in early June of 2023. Um, and so there are three parts of tonight's meeting materials. There is a proposed standards memorandum um, with high level proposed building facade and roof design standards for the gateway code. Uh, there's also a building design lookbook, we're calling it, which is a companion document to the proposed standards with images illustrating different building facade and roof design strategies. And third, there is a set of images illustrating three types of public open spaces envisioned for the gateway area uh, to help stimulate a preliminary discussion of open space amenities and design features desi desired for the gateway code. And I think David is going to put into the chat, if he can, a direct link to these materials. If you want to pull them up um, during this presentation to take a closer look at them, uh, you can also just enter into your search engine of choice, Arcata Gateway Plan, ongoing community outreach, and that will take you right to it as well. At least it did it, it did for me. So if you wanna take a closer look um, at these materials for uh, the uh, breakout session and have that in front of you, uh, you can do that. Okay, so as a reminder, we're talking about the gateway area tonight, which is 138 acres uh, west of downtown and north of Samoa, Samoa Boulevard that contains the Creamier District and existing industrial, commercial, and residential uses. Uh, the city's prepared a draft plan for the gateway area, which is currently under review by city commissions. This plan provides the policy foundation for the gateway code. At prior workshops, uh, we reviewed anticipated contents of the gateway code shown on the screen here. The gateway code will focus on the desired form and character of new development with an emphasis on creating active and welcoming public spaces. Uh, also at prior workshops, we discussed the different design topics that will be regulated in the gateway code shown on the screen here. At the last workshop we had, we focused on building massing strategies. Tonight, we're talking about facade design standards that relate to the outer skin of a building. It's important to remember that the proposed facade design standards will be accompanied by additional standards related to these other topics. In particular, the gateway code will require projects to comply with building massing standards that will prohibit monolithic blocks and break larger buildings up into smaller volumes. Uh, 
Other standards in the code will also address building placement, parking access and location, landscaping, fencing, screening, utilities, and lots of other similar topics. So at prior meetings um, the city has held, uh, the public has already provided comments about building facade and, re re and roof design issues. Some of the common themes that we've heard include the desire to maintain Arcata's unique sense of place, maintain existing whimsy of the creamery district, to encourage street level pedestrian activity, and to ensure well-designed facades with cues from the existing neighborhood and citywide design aesthetic. So this input was used to help prepare building facade and roof design policies in the draft gateway plan. Uh, and this plan and these policies call for varied and interesting facades, uh, building articulation with 360 degree design on all sides of the building, use of quality materials and attention to design detail and using the community benefits program as a way to enhance, uh, to incentivize enhanced, enhanced project design. And so based on these plan policies and prior public input, we have at this point proposed building facade and roof design standards for the gateway code. And the standards focus on seven topics shown here on the screen and included in the, included in the meeting materials is a memo uh, which contains these proposed standards. Now at this stage, the standard, standards are described at a high level and with guidance from the planning commission and city council, as we move through the process, the standards will be further developed and refined as we develop the code. It's important to emphasize also that as required by state law, all new standards must be objective and they may not require subjective judgment by the city when determining project conformance. And so also included in the meeting materials is the lookbook and the proposed standards and the lookbook are meant to be companion documents. So as an example, on the top of this slide is the proposed standard for ground floor frontages for non-residential uses. And this standard, as with all of the standards, includes an intent statement that describes what the proposed standard aims to achieve. And then the proposed standard itself with references to images in the lookbook is below that. Now in this example for the ground floor frontages, one of the referenced images is image number two from the look, lookbook um, with the ground floor frontage storefront design illustrating the transparency requirement in the proposed standard. Now this and other referenced images help to illustrate and clarify the standard and to facilitate a public discussion of these standards. The lookbook images are not intended to represent a preferred architectural style for the gateway area and in some cases may not conform with all of the standards anticipated for the gateway code. Instead, these images illustrate a range of different design st strategies for us to consider and reference during the gateway code development process. So now I'll briefly walk through the proposed standards, which you'll be able to discuss uh, more in your breakout rooms. So the first standard is facade articulation, which relates to the treatment of street-facing street building walls to create visual interest. And this standard as proposed would require projects to select a specified number of options from a list to satisfy the facade articulation requirement. And each project would be able to choose which of those options to use to satisfy the requirement. So here's a lookbook example where on this particular project, facade articulation is provided through contrasting facade materials and colors, reflective art features attached to the front facade, as well as other methods. So building on entries is the second set of standards in the proposed standards. 
And to support a pedestrian-oriented public realm, these proposed standards would require street-facing buildings to have at least one entrance every 100 feet for a non-residential use and every 200 feet for residential uses. The proposed standards will also require corner building entrances to face or be accessible from both streets, would require entrances of street-adjacent townhomes to face the street, and would require entrances to be emphasized and clearly visible from the street. So here's an example, again, of an image from the lookbook that shows a building with a prominent corner entry that's accessible from both streets. So this image is meant to illustrate uh, uh, the proposed uh, standard. Okay, so um, proposed roof form standards uh, in the proposed standards document aim to create architectural interest and to reduce the perceived mass of buildings. Similar to the facade articulation standard, uh, the proposed standards uh, for roof forms require visual interest in roof forms using specific methods, um, which may be chosen, chosen from a list of options. So here in this example, uh, roof lines are broken up through varied building heights and front building wall mod modulation uh, in addition to some other methods. Okay, so proposed window standards uh, aim to create visual interest and provide relief for flat walls. And these would require trim or recess for residential windows, would require window designs to differentiate the various components of the building, and would prohibit window films, mirrored glass, and spandrel glass along the ground floor frontage. So Sorrel Place here in Arcata um, is an example that illustrates a trim for residential windows, as well as differentiated window styles uh, for the ground floor lobby area. Uh, also included in the proposed standard is standards uh, is a ground floor frontage for non-residential uses, which I mentioned previously. Um, and this standard aims to support an active and welcoming pedestrian environment and would prohibit straight street facing ground floor building walls 30 feet or longer without an opening of some kind. And it also would require at least 65% of the ground floor of non-residential street facing building walls to be transparent, um, but with exceptions with landscaping where transparency isn't feasible. So here again is this example of a building um, that illustrates a continuous ground floor storefront transparency, which is actually more transparency than we're currently uh, thinking as the minimum required. Okay, let's see here. So uh, materials and colors. Um, uh, this standard would allow for varied exterior building materials and colors to count as one of the methods to satisfy in part the facade articulation standard. And, uh, but other than that, at this time, um, we're not proposing any other specific material, material, color material or color standard or requirement. So the Plaza Point Apartments building in Arcata is an example of uh, varied exterior colors and materials, uh, in this case with uh, about five different primary exterior building colors. Okay, the final proposed standard is for garage entries and doors uh, with the intent to minimize the visual dominance of garage entries and garage doors if they're included in a project design. And as proposed, this standard would allow garage doors serving individual units to face a public street subject to standards that minimize their visual prominence. Uh, the proposed standard would also require a landscape buffer and a maximum height at the street for structured uh, podium parking. So here's an example of townhomes with street facing garage doors that occupy about two thirds of the ground floor building facade. 
Um, so that's an overview of the proposed standards with some of the lookbook images. You'll have an opportunity to look at those standards more within your breakout room, look at some of the lookbook images some more um, as well, um, and talk about the specific standards. Um, but once you're in your breakout room, we're also interested in your reaction to uh, the example projects within the lookbook. Um, in particular, we'd like to hear from you which facade and roof design features shown in the lookbook you might want to see in the gateway area, and if there are any that you would not want to say, see in the gateway area. And uh, again, we ask that you please focus your attention on the facade and roof design of the buildings, not on the building massing and heights shown in the example. And so within your breakout rooms, your facilitator will also ask for input on each standards, in particular, if you have thoughts on how the standard could be further refined to best achieve their intent statements. And also remember that the gateway code will contain other standards in addition to these building facade and roof form standards, including standards to break up the massing of larger and taller buildings. So it's possible that within your breakout room group, you won't have enough time to discuss each proposed standard in detail. That's okay. Uh, after the meeting tonight, we encourage you to participate in the online survey for this topic, which allows you to provide comments on all of tonight's um, materials. So on the screen right now is a QR code that you could use to access the survey. Um, you'll also be able to access, or access the survey by visiting the city's gateway plan webpage. And I anticipate that the city will also be sending out um, email notifications regarding the availability of this online survey. So I'm now gonna briefly um, shift gears to speak about public open space. Oops, got ahead of myself. So the gateway plan calls for um, establishing an open space system along streets and paths that enhance community interaction and complement the urban environment. Uh, the plan envisions public uh, these open spaces promoting public gathering, enjoyment, and active and passive use by a broad range of the community. So these policies related to open space emphasize creating a diversity of open spaces within the gateway area with a range of activities and all incorporating a high quality of design. So the gateway code will include standards for public open space. And we ant anticipate that the go gateway code will um, require a community square within the Barrel District uh, will require linear parks adjacent to restored creeks, will incentivize privately owned publicly accessible open space through the Community Benefits Program, and will include design standards for all open spaces. And I'm gonna show a few images to help stimulate your thinking about public open spaces in the Gateway area. Uh, starting first with privately owned public open space. So as I mentioned, the draft plan calls for the gateway code to incentivize development that creates publicly accessible open space as a community benefit. And the code would contain standards for the design uh, of these spaces and amenities provided. So here's an example of a little plaza provided through new development. Uh, in downtown Benicia. Here is um, some publicly accessible open space um, as part of a development project in Midtown Oakland. And here is a much enjoyed uh, Transamerica Redwood Park in San Francisco, which was created through the city's long existing publicly accessible private open space program. And so the gateway plan also calls for creating new linear parks adjacent to daylighted, daylighted and restored segments of creeks. And the gateway code would require new development to create such new linear parks subject to design standards in the code. 
So here are a couple of examples of newly created linear parks in the urban environments. Here's one um, in the city of Linwood in the Southern California. Here's a very interesting application in San Diego um, and another newly established uh, uh, linear park in Westwood in Los Angeles. And the last type of uh, open space to talk about is uh, the community square envision for the barrel district. Uh, and the code will require new development to create this new community square subject to standards uh, within the code. Here's an example of a newly cre created town square in uh, Copperopolis in the Sierra foothills. And here's an example of a public plaza created as part of the Fruitvale Station transit-oriented development project in Oakland. And so in your breakout rooms, um, you'll spend a little bit of time sharing your thoughts about open spaces in the gateway area, uh, particularly which amenities and design features you would like to see in these different types of open spaces. Now, this is a preliminary discussion uh, to hear some of your early thoughts, and we'll return with more specific proposed standards for you to consider at a future workshop. So with that, um, my presentation, thankfully, is coming to an end, um, and we're now going to separate into breakout rooms so that you can share your thoughts on the meeting materials. Uh, remember that if you have technical difficulties, there are staff and consultants who can help you if you share an email or if you send um, chat uh, or uh, comments in the chat function, um, we can help you out. So hopefully uh, everything will run smoothly uh, with the breakout rooms. And so you're gonna be randomly assigned to a room and in your room, you will find a facilitator and a note taker uh, to help manage the discussion and record your input. Um, we'll also be recording um, with a, a video of the breakout room discussion um, for our records as well. And um, while you're in the breakout room, uh, we do thank you for raising your hand to speak, um, being courteous to one another, speaking one at a time, respecting differences of opinion, uh, muting yourself in less speaking, and lastly, if possible, um, turning on your video. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, don't worry if you don't get to everything on your mind within your breakout room, or if your group doesn't finish with all of the proposed standards, uh, we encourage you to, to complete the building facade and roof design survey uh, through which you can comment on all of tonight's materials. The survey also uh, allows for you to submit photographs and other images uh, if you wanna do that. Uh, the survey will close on January 30th. And after that, our next step is for the Planning Commission to hold a work session on Saturday, February 11th in the morning, at which the commission will consider a more fully formed set of proposed standards relating to the facade and roof design topics we're talking about today, and also about the building massing topics that we talked about at the last virtual workshop. And then in February, March, and April, we'll also be holding additional vir virtual workshops on other gateway topics with additional surveys and planning commission work sessions as well. And for those future meetings, um, Dates will be announced as soon as they are scheduled. So um, with that, uh, that uh, officially concludes my presentation. Uh, David, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that before we break out. Sounds like no. So thank you, everybody, so much for being here. Um, your input, um, and I say this sincerely, it is needed and it is appreciated. Um, and we hope that you stay engaged. Um, you can find more information on the project website, and you can also contact Dilo or Jen with the emails on the screen um, with more questions, comments, um, or to get in touch with us. So um, with that, uh, we will now assign you to your breakout room, and I'll see you back here 
in about an hour. And I have just um, started the recording button, so um, uh, this uh, conversation will be recorded. And um, I do uh, request that, if at all possible, to turn um, your video on. I think the 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 goal here is for us to have a dialogue and for us to have a conversation. Uh, and um, we can be much more successful doing that if we all can see one another's lovely faces. Sort of imagine we're at an in-person workshop and we're all sitting uh, around a table. Uh, we have materials in front of us and we're all talking about them and having a conversation. So if you can, uh, uh, turning your video on would be greatly appreciated. So um, let's see. So as I mentioned in the intro, there are sort of three main parts to this breakout room discussion. Uh, the first part is going to be to see if you have any reaction to um, the uh, lookbook images. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about the proposed standards. And then we'll talk a little bit about the open space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, share my screen. If I can do that, okay, I've done that. And then um, I am going to this two page and then I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to try to hide my toolbar. You, uh, that's okay not to hide my toolbar. Okay, so um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have put together um, this document that we're called it, calling the Building Design Lookbook. And this is really a resource document um, that we're using to help think about building facade and roof design strategies. And I wanna emphasize that, um, as I said in the presentation, this is not meant to represent um, recommended architectural style. Um, it's also not meant to illustrate um, uh, the intended building heights and massing. It's really focused on specific building facade design techniques to illustrate some uh, approaches that we may want to codify within the gateway code. So um, if you had a chance to look at this in advance, um, that's great. Uh, many of you may not have been able to do that. So I'm going to just sort of briefly kind of walk you through what's in this. So there's a series of um, photographs, uh, probably about 40 that are illustrating these different buildings. And that for each of these buildings, um, it calls out some different building facade and roof design features that are related to the issues that we think we're gonna wanna regulate in the gateway code. So for example, I'm going to zoom in here. There's this particular building, our very first image. This is a building that is in Oakland in the Bay Area. And we're showing this because it highlights certain facade design features, uh, contrasting uh, building materials and colors. These are townhome style buildings with units that don't front a street but do front an interior courtyard. And one of the ways that, artic that the building facade is articulated, at least this facade that's facing this courtyard, is through the use of these um, projecting bay windows. So here, this is illustrating um, a, a, a number of different uh, uh, facade design approaches and features um, that's relevant to uh, some of the proposed standards that were 
um, considering. So here, let me zoom in on another one. So here's a building in Berkeley. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're thinking about is roof design. Um, you may not care for the height or the massing of this building, but it does illustrate certain things that's instructive for us. So there's multiple intersecting street facing roof forms. And you may have met, uh, remembered in my presentation, we're very interested in how roof forms um, uh, relate to how a building um, is seen uh, against the sky. Um, we're also, uh, this, this particular example is also showing sort of these decorative horizontal access lines or accent lines, both here as well as here, as well as um, uh, recessed windows. So these are different uh, design strategies that are illustrated in that particular image. So um, that's the lookbook um, kind of overall gist. Um, let me see if maybe one other uh, may be worth highlighting. And one thing that, uh, oh, so I'll, I'll zoom into an Arcata example as my list is my last example to highlight. So here's the Plaza Point apartments here in Arcata that have been included, have been included. and there are a number of different design features that we think are instructive um, for the gateway code. Uh, so things like varied balcony railing materials. You can see um, some balcony balconies have a wood material for the railing, some have metal. Um, so a varied use of materials. Um, there's also varied roof forms with a gable roof as well as a shed roof. And as I mentioned in the presentation, um, a different exterior building colors, in this case, five different building colors. And then there are a lot of other things about this building that are instru instructive uh, in our conversation um, of, of um, facade and roof design. So with that, I'm going to sort of stop talking about this and pose um, sort of a, a pretty open-ended question to see if, um, for those of you who have had a chance to look at this maybe in a little more detail or just based on things that you're seeing here, um, uh, are there examples of building um, facade and roof design features that you would like to see in the gateway area? Um, and are there things that maybe you would not want to see in the gateway area, particularly thinking about the facade articulation, uh, building on entries and other aspects of building design that we're interested in. And as I mentioned um, uh, in the presentation, please try not to gravitate towards building height and massing, but really just think about the facade and roof design strategies and things that you like and don't like. Okay, so if anybody has anything that they want to say, um, you can unmute yourself, you can raise your hand, uh, and you can provide some of your thoughts. Uh, if you want me to zoom in to anything, I can do that. If you... Um, if you have this document open on your computer, computer, you can kind of poke around as well. And also keep in mind that you'll have an opportunity to provide comment uh, through the online survey after tonight um, if you need some time to think about some of these things uh, a little more. So any, any thoughts, any questions? Well, it looks like Colin might have a comment. Let's see. Colin. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the presentation, Ben, and for all your work on this. Um, I don't have a lot of strong opinions about um, sort of facade aesthetics, but uh, I, I do have uh, <laughs> strong feelings about the pedestrian orientation of it, particularly at the, at the ground floor. And so... Um, I what I 
The one thing that I really don't like is having driveways and garages facing the street. Um, I think that presents uh, sort of an unfriendly pedestrian environment and also, um, you know, the more the more garages and curb cuts, the more of a safety hazard there is. So um, I would uh, weigh in against having street facing garages. And I guess secondarily, um, you know, I like the more engaging uh, sort of pedestrian street frontages, some of them that were kind of recessed or a little bit more blank um, seem a little bit less pedestrian friendly. So thanks. Mm -hmm. So if I could just quickly follow up. So, so Colin, would you say sort of on your second comment that, you know, this has a somewhat more recessed ground floor, um, maybe with a little less going on in the ground floor frontage on this side, would that, would this be an example of the sort of, image that you would have a little concern with? Yeah, I think uh, it's hard for me to tell from some of the images what the actual pedestrian experience is like because they're, you know, taken from a distance. But, um, you know, if there's sort of a lot of uh, or the recessed issue, you know, I think it's fine to have like an arcade or something where there's a covered walkway. But if you have to if there's a lot of empty space with nothing, you know, to do in it between the sidewalk and the building, that seems a little bit less engaging for a pedestrian. Um, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. Thanks. And I see Fred, you have your hand raised. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Ben. Sure. Um, I'm fully aware that your lookbook images are meant to be representational, but and not of a particular architectural style. I've got that. But I have a concern, and you can tell me what your experience is in other, other locations, that a form-based code would have to be carefully done so that developers won't default to a design that they know will work or will go through, a pro, uh, through the approval process easily. Uh, do you, you understand what I'm saying? Can you, can you try saying that once? Okay, together? sure. Well, that that, that uh, we have these representations here, which I, I know are not something to be copied or uh, or that, you know will take as as a given, but that a developer who wants to get his his things approved quickly may may choose something that he knows will um, be uh, subject to the form based code in a way that. Um, will result in these kinds of designs you know uh that's that's a concern for me that that the developers themselves know that that it's very open that the the, the code doesn't determine buildings that look like this mm -hmm. do, do you, you you get my yeah, question I, here I, okay i think i do i think yeah I do. okay and the um next thing is that arcade is small as you know um we can look at the design for uh, that we are want to achieve on on almost either a block by block basis or even individual lots. You know, we have um, one of the blocks that I look at is 11th and K, where the um, clothing dock and German Motors is here. I think that's a real prime block for redevelopment. Uh, what we want there is something that's that's is suitable for that particular intersection. Um, will the form-based code be that distinct, do you think, that it will apply to certain blocks for design elements? Yeah, I think that... Um, great. Do you, want, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, yeah, yeah go question? ahead. No? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, so I'll start with the second one. And so um, there, there currently uh, there are four districts within the gateway area, each of which uh, we anticipate will have a um, unique set of standards um, related to um, uh, building and site design. And uh, whether or not we drill down even deeper and apply some unique standards to say an individual block, it's a possibility, uh, 
um, if there's one block with some very unique conditions where some unique set of standards need to apply, we can certainly do that. And the form-based code will be, or the gateway code, I should say, sort of will be will provide us the framework and the flexibility to do that. I think that's something that we'll be talking about with the planning commission um, at uh, their work session when we drill down a little deeper and talk about some more specific proposed standards. So I think if we decide that that's necessary, um, we certainly can do that. And you know, there, I think there's there's really three layers of of um, uh, standards that the gateway code will contain. There'll be standards that will be broadly applicable to the entire. Um, district. And then there'll be standards that are applicable just to each individual um, uh, form and character district of the four that we've identified so far. And then I think it is possible that there'll be some sort of block or site-specific standards to, to address a unique condition on a particular property. So that's certainly on the table, certainly on the table. And then I think with your first question, um, you know, so these images uh, is a reference for us to use so that when we talk about um, window trim, we have something tangible that we can look at as an example. Um, when we talk about, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, variation in window size and pattern, we have a number of different images that we can look at to illustrate that. And then using these reference materials, we're going to develop the actual standards that will be accompanied by graphics. And um, once the gateway code is adopted by the city council with those standards and with those graphics, that will then become the criteria that the city will use to approve projects and the criteria that an applicant will use to decide what they need to design and what they need to propose to be consistent with the standards. And I think, you know, as many of you know, there are state law that says that if a project um, that includes residential uses is consistent with all objective standards, um, the city needs to approve uh, the project unless the city can find that the project would result in a um, substantive impact of public health and safety. So I think, I think Fred, I think I understood your question. These images, once the gateway code are adopted, is not will not be a basis for an applicant to propose a project and will not be a basis for the city to decide if a project is consistent with the standards. The standards and the graphics contained in the code ultimately will provide that basis. Very good, thank you. Uh, okay. That's a good answer. Sure. I, I have another question, but I wanna let other people go. Okay, back thanks Fred. Thanks. Thank you. Let's see, any other, for some reason in my view, I have a hard time seeing if people have, oh, Kyle. Yes, you have your hand raised. Yeah, good evening. How's everybody doing? Great. Good, good. I just wanted to touch base. Um, uh, I follow along. I'm a local developer, so I develop here. I think we've developed 20-some uh, units in the last year or two here in Arcata, and, and we're looking to develop probably another 50 to 60 in the next couple of years, and, and we own a few lots in the Gateway area that are up coming. So I think it's good for me to kind of provide some input of what we're currently going through and what we foresee in the future. Um, you know, I'm liking a lot of things that we're hearing and a lot of the examples um, that are being provided. Uh, you know, a big thing is obviously cost when it comes to the developer standpoint. Um, you know, when it comes to market rate specifically is what we mostly do. I know Danco specifically does a lot of low income housing that is subsidized and things like that, which, uh, you know, provide additional funding that, you know, make it easier to develop certain projects in certain circumstances. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me is, um, you know, like Danco's new projects and stuff like that, like you have listed here, the four story building and point plaza, you know, those are all well-designed and modern and a lot of the new developers and, you know, this, this time and stuff are developing that in that direction because that's kind of the new structures that are, that are being built in certain areas. 
And, uh, but, you know, one thing just to keep in mind from my point of view is, is just cost. You know, a lot of people don't really understand the costs that are involved uh, with developing and, and building these buildings. Um, and I think it's very important to break up the facade of the building and incorporate a lot of different design features um, during the process. But we also need to keep into consideration um, cost involved too, that could also burden a developer that would limit the amount of housing that could be developed. Um, you know, what I'm saying, the basic design standards, like from New Danco's building, the modern square four story building this step i think we'll see a lot of that and, and that's pretty you know cost effective and straightforward to build um yeah I, th I think that's it you know if anybody has any questions for me but i just wanted to kind of touch base from a development standpoint um you know with the costs involved and things like you know things like that i think it's very important that we um, incorporate certain design standards into the city and the gateway area I mean, it's obviously going to be a, a large change, um, you know, but I think a lot of new developers that will come in and build these larger projects will, um, you know, stick to new modern designs and we'll see a lot of that. And I think things will come together over time. It might be a, a little bit of a shock, but I think uh, eventually it'll start to feel more like a, a nice downtown area. So uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for your comment. Um, one thing I will point out is that in these images, we included a mix of market rate as well as affordable projects, um, uh, in part to think about this cost question. And definitely, we're thinking a lot about um, making sure that the design standards don't become a barrier to housing production, which is really the city's um, primary goal uh, in this area. So uh, point very well taken. Thank you for that. Yeah, right. absolutely. Thank you. Any any other sort of maybe general comments or comments about you know other things that you see here that maybe you don't like or wouldn't want to see in the gateway area before we move on? Let's see. Okay, Colin. Is your did you yeah. raise your hand again? I, I did. Um, okay. I'll I'll make it quick. I just uh, one sort of concern I have is just that we uh, don't have roof line standards that get in the way of um, providing uh, solar PV, you know, in a cost effective way. Um, I know that's sometimes a problem with with these standards, so I just want to have that kept in mind. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. All right, so any other comments about things you want to see or don't want to see in the gateway area related to building facade design before we switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the specific proposed standards? Okay, in that case, I will endeavor to open another document. Let's see here if I can do it. I can. Okay. So um, for those who uh, haven't taken a look at the materials previously, um, up on the city's website, there is a memo that I put together uh, that introduces the proposed standards that kind of covers some of the um, points that I made in the presentation. Uh, right now, these are kind of higher level, um, more general descriptions of what we have in mind um, that we wanted to share with the general public um, before we take something that's a little bit more developed to the Planning Commission for them to talk about and give us direction. And um, it relates to uh, these seven different topics that right now we're thinking are aspects of, of building facade and roof design that we care about um, for the gateway code. And we think that there probably needs to be something in the gateway code about um, these things. And some of these standards may be applied generally to the entire gateway area. Um, some of them may be more tailored um, for individual districts or if, sub areas within the gateway area. And maybe even as Fred was saying, there's some blocks in particular where some um, you know, very site specific standards are needed. And then so um, as mentioned in the presentation, uh, way we've approached this is we've 
we've included an intent statement that's linked to what the plan says, and it is linked to things that we've heard in the past um, through public participation um, that articulates really what we're trying to achieve here. What's the intent of the standard? What's the reason to have this rule within the gateway code? Um, and then uh, following that int intent statement, we have a proposal um, for how that stand how a standard might achieve um, that intent. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get started with this facade articulation standard. Um, and as I mentioned in the presentation, um, facade articulation uh, relates to um, features on the exterior building wall facing uh, a public street or a public place um, that creates visual interest um, within the public realm. And so what we're trying to intend or what we're trying to achieve here is to create street facing building facades that are varied and interesting with human scale design details. Um, and then we also want to incorporate architectural elements into the facade design that reduce the perceived mass and the box-like appearance of buildings. This is something that we've heard um, over and over at prior um, workshops is a concern about sort of these monolithic box-like buildings um, occupying an entire block and wanting to make sure that the gateway code um, uh, mitigates that in some way. So um, what we have in mind for this facade articulation standard, as I mentioned in the presentation, is um, to require projects to select a specified number of options from a list to satisfy this facade articulation requirement and to allow each individual project to choose which options to use. Um, and so there would be a list. Um, we have a list that we have started, started here. Um, and it could be a long list. We possibly will divide this list into different categories. Um, we might require projects to do one thing from each category. We haven't really decided that yet. But I think the underlying philosophy is to allow individual projects to choose a particular facade articulation strategy that works best um, to provide for the creativity of individual project design and to not fall into a trap of a formulaic um, design aesthetic for all buildings within the gateway area. So um, a lot of these different sort of techniques are illustrated in the lookbook, um, contrasting materials, use of bay windows, building wall modulation. A lot of these different examples do these things. And I think the idea, the proposal that we have at this stage that we're interested in your thoughts on is to allow an individual project to choose different features um, to um, achieve the uh, intent, to, to achieve a project with visual interest um, when viewed from the public realm. So um, I think with that, um, uh, you know, I'm happy to maybe show some of the lookbook images if you want to talk more about some specific examples, but really interested in your reactions to see if you have any thoughts at this point about sort of this type of standard and whether you think it's um you know on the right track in terms of achieving what what you hope to see uh in regards to facade articulation within the gateway area so anyone anyone with thoughts please please raise your hand So a clarifying question for you, Ben. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, one of these says green walls. Now, do you mean the color or vegetation? Vegetation. So I mean like a wall um, that has vegetation on it as a permanent picture of, um, of that wall. 
Ah, awesome. and I see, Sweat. I see two hands, two hands have gone up uh, in the meantime. <laughs> uh, so Fred, I think you had your hand up first. Yes, thank you. Um, when you talk about articulation to avoid a uh, box-like structure in the lookbook, what I see is um, small windows uh, creating kind of a box-like structure, such as uh, number 16, Ashby Lofts, if you can page to that, and 15, uh, Mesa Terrace, San Jose. Um, so I know, I know we're talking about articulation, not window size, but it seems that the um, size and placement of the windows goes a long way towards making for a less box-like structure. Um, other, okay, okay, okay. Uh, number seven, Jefferson. Uh, let's see, you know that e even that has has uh, large blank surfaces. Um, mm -hmm. But the the first two I mentioned, fifth, sixteen, and fifteen, are are very box like from from my perspective. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And 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 um, I think what you're saying is that it's the the size. Um, and, you know, the percentage of the facade that's occupied by a window that sort of contributes to that box, like, and, and the, and the perception. single planar surface. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. That's it. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you. Colin. Um, yeah, well, I hope to, I, uh, <laughs> Hate to be a broken record, but I'm I'm, I'm going to go back to the pedestrian orientation. Um, so for some of these uh, examples in the lookbook, um, the primary facade uh, is quite different from the um, ground floor frontage, and some of them it's kind of integrated. And so I just was wondering if you could comment on whether any of these standards would make it easier or more difficult to um, to create that sort of pedestrian oriented frontage on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, you know, I think that's an interesting question. I, and I, and I think that, um, that my my initial reaction to that is that we're anticipating kind of a separate set of standards that's focused on that ground floor street facing um, design and that with those other standards in place that um, we can have certainty that that ground floor frontage would be designed in a way that um, adequately supports a positive pedestrian environment. So I think the short answer to your question is, I don't think any of these strategies, in a, in a given the, the the existence of other strategies, would would um, would diminish um, that ground floor experience. Got it. Thanks. Let's see. Oh, I think we have another hand. Peter. Yeah, thanks. I see all these options you have listed, and obviously the intent is to get uh, varied designs um, uh, of different buildings. But what's to prevent developers from just doing the same design over and over again? because it's cost effective and it got approved. As you pointed out, if it meets the requirements, the city has to approve it. And how about if they're all the same? What prevents them from being all the same? Mm -hmm. That's a great comment. Um... And um, and I think that we can think about what sort of regulatory mechanism could be put in place to prevent that sort of thing from happening. So thank you for that. Let's see. Um, 
E.R. E.R. Hirsch. I see you have your hand up. Do you, do you have a comment that you'd like to share about the facade articulation standard? You are you are still muted. Still muted, unfortunately. Let me see if I can. Unmute. Oh, thank there you. you go. All right, gotcha. thank you. You didn't <laughs> stay up long enough for me to uh, do that. So, <clears throat> my question is similar to what the uh, what the last gentleman just asked. Uh -huh. um, are any of those uh, pictures that we're looking at? Are any of those anything other than a developer builder's own aesthetic, or were they? built that way because of some zoning standard that was in place. Uh, and I, and I agree what's to keep, um, what's to keep the uh, developer from building. He's building market rate. His, I, his whole emphasis, if you're in business is to maximize profits doing all these beautiful little quirky things seems expensive and unnecessary if I'm a builder trying to maximize profits. I, how do we, I don't know, are we able to regulate that type of thing? And any of these buildings that we're looking at, did any of those builders, developers, design those buildings based on anything other than their own aesthetic and not because they were guided to by by some kind of uh, plan, uh, municipal plan? Mm -hmm. So um, that's a great question and great comment. And so um, all of these buildings to varying extent, um, the design was dictated by either a plan or a code. Um, and so since we're on this page here, uh, in San Mateo, in, um, in the Bay Area, Bay Meadows um, was a large redevelopment of a former racetrack and they prepared a number of different specific plans with very sort of prescriptive design requirements and so this particular building that you see here um was uh consistent with that particular um, 20, plan 20. Uh, number 36 here just as okay. just as an example um okay. and let's see here if i can pull up um a, another example so um uh, the landing in alameda this is alameda point um this is uh another example of kind of uh, more of a of a specific plan for a redevelopment area formal former um, military base where um fairly prescriptive design standards um, were put in place and a project would need to conform to it. So here's a project in the city of Berkeley, a little piece of it um, where um, there was not a specific plan um, uh, or sort of a form-based code that was dictating the design, but um, a zoning ordinance with various um, uh, design standards that the project would need to conform with. So I think there's sort of a spectrum of um, permissive versus prescriptive standards, and all of these projects would be um, subject to them. Okay, so on the question, there was a second part to your question about, um, I think, what, what would prevent a developer from just defaulting to the cheapest possible design um, without um, providing for visual interest or something that's adding variety to the project design consistent with the vision for the gateway area. And I think the answer to that question is that's what the gateway code is for. And um, part of our mission here is to find the right balance between establishing 
um, prescriptive mandatory design standards that create the create visual interest um, and balancing that with the um, the financial feasibility of new development. Um, it's actually against the law for the city to establish design standards that would make the housing infeasible to develop. So we must not do that, but we need to find that right, that 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 balance um, and make sure that we're getting the kinds of design details that we want, but that allows for financially feasible projects. And so there are a lot of examples in here of development um, that uh, uh, includes an affordable that was built with affordable housing financing um, where uh, visual interest was possible, articulation was possible in a project that's maybe, you know, not like super high end. So, you know, as an interesting example, on one end of the spectrum, you have, let me go to it. Where is this thing? Uh... Oh, here we go. Okay, here's a beautiful project on Pacific, Pacific Heights, San Francisco, market rate. This, this building costs a gazillion dollars to build. They do a lot of really nice things in it, but it was really, really expensive. I guarantee it. Again, this one on Van Ness as well. Um, an attractive building, I think, from a lot of people's perspectives, it was not, it was really expensive to build. But um, there are other expensive to, to be a renter in. Right. But, but there are other examples of buildings here that um, uh, include affordable units and were actually built by affordable developers. Um, and so um, we want to make sure that we think about those projects um, as well um, as sort of the market rate projects and find the right find the right balance, um, the right assortment of options um, to allow for a financially feasible development. Okay, any other any other sort of comments about the various fa facade articulation strategies that you're seeing here, things that you like or you don't like. I'm wondering if, you know, because this is a um, arcade example, everyone is, I would imagine, familiar with um, Plaza part, Point Apartments. You know, this, this building is doing a lot of things um, with facade articulation. Uh, you have modulation in the building wall, you have the balconies, you have sort of a variety of roof forms, um, you have a variety of materials, you have contrasting colors and materials. Are things that you are there things here that you see um, that you like as a facade articulation strategy or maybe things that you don't like quite as much? Well, if I'm still unmuted. Yeah, you are, yep. Okay, then I would say the variety of shapes and colors and textures certainly reduces the boxy. But how I don't, you know, once you get over the the you know the 30 feet is that possible uh, without being overly expensive? I don't know if who built that Danco, I think. It, 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 if they say they can't go much over 30 feet without getting terribly expensive, who's, you know, I mean, we talk about affordability, and I just wonder, you know, I mean, at I'm just thinking at current um, per square foot to build right now, you're you're at sort of the outer limit. I mean, certainly it's more than most students 
could afford unless they have parents of means to support them. I don't know how somebody working for even what the new minimum wage is could afford to live there without paying, you know, more than half their half their monthly income to to be able to afford that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all good comments. Thank you. So I think, Fred, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, this is actually one of my least favorite designs. I don't personally don't care for a design that is supposed to simulate uh, five or six or seven individual buildings on a block. If you can scroll down to uh, number 25, um, let's see, you know, that's an example of a single building that shows us as a single building, um, 40 also is is that way um i know that plaza point is kind of a contemporary design yeah the the, the landing in alameda to, to me that is a far better design uh with articulation it, it doesn't pretend to be six different structures it's a single structure um and scrolling up to number nine uh let's see similar uh again th these are these are my uh aesthetic ideas this is what i regard as a well-designed building with uh facade articulation um but the um the plaza point as i said is is a kind of a currently in thing i would i would love to see none of them built like that but again it's a matter of aesthetics or opinions uh and or you can weigh in on this thanks mm-hmm yeah um i think that uh you're not alone i've heard that from other people as well um i think that there are varying uh sort of opinions on that particular project and i've heard exactly what you've said um said by other people as well so i think peter you had you had your hand up i think next yeah you ask what um things i like or dislike what i like is that there's a large solar array on that building. All right, yeah, that Edley. Uh huh. Where is that? This one, number three. When you saw that, you liked that, huh? On the uh, the building in Arcata. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, on the Plaza Point. So yep. you like you like you like the fact that it has that um yeah it has a panel. solar array on mm -hmm. on many of the roofs and uh -huh. I don't know if it displaces all the electricity used in the building probably not but it certainly makes a difference uh -huh. and I think we should encourage that okay great thank you for that all right Colin you have your hand up yeah, um, I would second Peter's comment, but what I was going to say is that, you know, from the street level, the way I experience Plaza Point is not really as like, you know, one building or a series of building, but as a series of storefronts. And, um, and you know, I, I enjoy that. It's um, lots of things to look at as a pedestrian. And so from that perspective, uh, I like it, although it's a little bit less interesting on the I street side where there's um, less going on. Mm -hmm. And what about Sorrel Place? Does anybody have any thoughts about this particular building, uh, particularly thinking about facade articulation or maybe anything else that you like or don't like or things that you think were more successful or less successful in the design? No thoughts on that? Oh, Colin. All right. If no one else is going to speak up. <laughs> um, I, um, I like it. And especially as, you know, as a residential uh, building that, that doesn't have um, commercial on the ground floor, I think it does a good job of still being engaging, you know, that the big sort of common room that you kind of can 
check out every when you walk by and all the the ground floor balconies and things it's um it's it it doesn't present a big blank face or anything um so it's, um, it's interesting to to walk by okay all right and fred i think that you have your hand up yes thank you um this building is set back from the curb it's it's uh the the row of cars directly in front of the building is actually um where the, the the line that's in the street is you can see is where the curb is it was set back to provide some more parking there um but to me it wasn't set back far enough the um i find it very interesting i, I don't walk past i'll walk on the other side of the street it's a north facing building and it's very cold on that side of the street for uh eight or so months of the year but the uh, I think a lot more could have been done to make that more interesting on the ground floor level, e even though it's, it doesn't have storefronts, as as was said. Um, and that brings up the many, many of the buildings that you show are set back with some kind of a plaza in front, and many are not. And it, it makes a huge difference in terms of the appearance and the uh, what we'll call livability or or attraction of the building. Um, that's different from the articulation. And I know we, we you talked about in your presentation. Um, that's a, uh, been talked about in terms of uh, how the form based code is going to evolve and what kind of setbacks are going to be required on what blocks or what areas. And it, it makes for a hugely more pedestrian friendly environment as, as you definitely know. Okay. Thank you, for, thank you for that. Yeah, the we will the gateway code will have building placement standards um, and um, landscaping requirements and uh, public space standards. So uh, thank you for those thoughts. That's definitely good to hear. Okay, ER ER Hirsch, Mr. Hirsch, your hand is up. So you can call me Ed. Ed um, okay, thanks. So Fred brings up a very interesting uh, point about the Sorrel Place, which is the building we were just talking about, its orientation. And the front of the building is north facing. So as Fred pointed out, it's cold. It's, 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 it, they don't see the sun on that side of the building ever. And I just think that building orientation is so important. I mean, for the health of the building, for the health of the residents, it makes a difference. I I don't know if that's something that could be put into the code that uh, how how a building can be oriented. I mean, I'm not a builder, so I don't really I don't really know, but to have something where you are not going to see daylight for most of the year doesn't seem like the building has been oriented on that lot properly. I, I suppose it had to do with the fact that they wanted the front of the building on the street rather than facing towards the old um, for dealership there, but I, I think that it's an important thing to consider in in the if we're developing a a, a form based code is building orientation, particularly as it relates to solar access. It sounds yes, like absolutely that's so important these days if we're trying to get away from the high cost of energy i mean if you're if you're oriented to the north you're going to have the heat on all the time whether electric no matter what whatever it takes and i i'm pretty sure that people are still going to have to pay for whatever form of of um energy whether it's wind solar uh gas electric whatever it is there's still going to be a cost associated with that. Great. Thank you, Ed, for that. So I'm noting the time, and um, we have a little bit more time in the breakout room. We also had the 
open space design materials, um, as well as other proposed standards that we could talk about. I guess I'm wondering, let's see, in, in the, in the, 10 minutes or so that we have left together. Um, is there anything that anybody uh, particularly wants to comment on um, in these materials that are sort of before you today? And I guess, well, maybe you're thinking about that. I can put in another plug for um, for the online survey, which will give you um, uh, an additional opportunity to provide some input. If you have photographs of things that you like or you don't like, you know, certain building features that you want, you would want the, the gateway code to encourage or require things that you want to make sure that the code does not allow, you can upload those photos um, and share those with us. And that's all gonna that's gonna help us as we continue to further um, develop and refine these standards. Okay, so Fred, all right, Fred. I have I have a question, but it's not huh? related to these materials. So I'd like anyone else to go first. Okay. Can I just check in real quick? I'm sorry, I'm jumping in. Oh, hi, um, Jen. Ben, where are you guys at in your grouping? Have you moved I to open space yet? You know, I think we we haven't, but I think that that's okay. And we're just right now kind of wrapping things up with final thoughts. Okay. No, that's great. I'm just checking in. I have one group that literally has already gone through open space. Oh. And so they're going to go back through a little more slowly. Okay. Um, and then I have another group that just started. I just, just checking in where everybody's at. What, I'm going to leave what, you now. What time What time do we want to kind of reconvene? I'm thinking 745-ish. I'll check back in and see okay. where you guys are at. All right. That, that sounds, sounds okay. great. Thanks for checking in. I was actually wondering about that. All right. I'll touch base uh, a little closer to 745 and see how you're okay. doing. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, I think Fred offered if anybody has something to say about these materials in our remaining 15 minutes. Um, if you want to talk about the open space stuff, we can do that. If you want to talk about any more of these proposed standards, um, we can do that. Colin, I see you have your hand raised. You have something for us. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to briefly comment uh, about the discussion that was just being had about building orientation is that I think building buildings can be oriented in different senses for different purposes. And so I think, you know, the street frontage of the building needs to be, you know, pedestrian oriented, but, you know, certainly you can also consider and should consider, you know, maximizing passive solar gain and other things like that um, for, uh, for that type, for that part of the design. I think that, um, you know, we think about the facade, we're primarily talking about the street facing facade, but you can't uh, necessarily, you know, control the direction of the street facing facade because the grid is already pretty much set, uh, the street grid. So, um, but I think, I think that's sort of a, a, a separate design consideration um, that, that should be considered, I guess. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Colin. Okay. All right. I think Fred, you're on. Okay. Um, ben, you're undoubtedly aware of the L Street, K Street question uh, that the draft plan once uh, proposes making K Street one way going north and L Street one way going south. And there's a lot of people who would like to see L Street be made into a linear park. Um, the question is, uh, it seems to me that this has to be firmly established before any real progress in the form-based code would take place. Uh, currently, buildings on L Street or K Street could be six-story, um, but if there's a linear park on L Street, then those buildings I don't think would be six-story, nor would the backs of the buildings on K Street. 
uh, that face L Street would they would seems to me that they would taper down to something more reasonably like two or three stories. So what I've been pushing for is a decision on this prior to your work. And um, uh, I don't know if you're prepared to say anything about this now, but uh, M is and do you regard that as correct that a decision needs to be made as to the fate of of L Street, whether it's a, going to be a park or a thoroughfare street? Uh, prior to you really formulating much of the form based code um i would i from my personal perspective um we should know what the plan says on that subject and that the code should reflect um the the contents of the plan on, on that subject and um, whether or not that needs to be called out as a um, sort of discrete decision um, uh, by the decision makers is something that, you know, uh, is above my pay grade and would, would need to be decided. Um, by city, okay. No, by good, city staff. good answer. I, I, I'm in favor of the, uh, it being a linear park, which opens it up to all kinds of um, uh, storefronts and um, eating establishments and things that would be part of that kind of a park-like environment, which I, I think would be an outstanding uh, center for Arcata. But that's, again, my opinion. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And, you know, with we're in, we're in a position where there is a draft plan um, that's being reviewed and it will evolve um, over time as it goes through the public review process. And um, and I anticipate that the draft code, once it's prepared, it will it will evolve as well, reflecting changes that occur in the plan. So, you know, my experience is that you know you can sort of proceed with this work, even if there's some um, decisions that have not been fully made with the ability to circle back and make revisions as needed, depending on how, you know, the plan itself evolves over time. This is my perspective on that. Colin, I see your, your hand is up. Yeah. I, I just wanted to comment that from my perspective, um, this issue of, of, of Ellen K street, uh, what's, being talked about as a linear park um, for L Street would still be a bicycle and pedestrian corridor, um, you know, not just for recreation, but for transportation as currently um, exists through much of that corridor, a class one trail or, or, or even greater standards. And so from my perspective, um, you know, what Fred is sort of talking about with you know, inviting storefronts and, and so forth, it doesn't really uh, change the facade or, or or height or anything like that very much um, because what we want on all the streets is, is a pedestrian-oriented, um, you know, facade, and that's going to be a pedestrian corridor whether there are cars there or not. So um, that's... At least, uh, that's my perspective. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Ed. Ed's inspired. Well, on on that point that Fred and um, Colin are making, the on L, since we're talking about L Street, um, having having it be a a linear park is certainly much more pedestrian friendly and having cars on it we don't have cars on it now and encouraging more more traffic on that road doesn't seem to be highly pedestrian friendly um, things happen we know that because of that horrible accident the other day so a place that people are already recreating, walking, biking, not having to interact with cars. 
I'm all for keeping it as a linear park. That's my comment. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Um, well, this is great. So, you know, when we go back to the full group, uh, the facilitators in each group is going to sort of summarize some of the major themes that we heard. And, you know, I think we, um, what, what I think I would sort of emphasize um, when I report back is that we, we had a number of comments about wanting to make sure that the gateway code somehow would prevent the same design everywhere um, and wanting to avoid a situation where a developer or multi multiple developers can just choose to do the same thing um, uh, because it's the cheapest or is it the easiest or it's the most familiar and then ending up with sort of a, a uniform design, which I think a lot of people um, don't care for. So I thought that was an interesting comment. Um, another thing I think we heard about is wanting to um, consider sort of the cost of the cost associated with the design standards that we're imposing. Um, both from the um, economic feasibility perspective of the developer, also from the perspective of the cost of the resident, either the renter or the buyer, and to keep that um, in mind. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would have to, I would also mention sort of the L Street, K Street uh, controversy being something on the top of everyone's minds right now. So in, in the 60 seconds um, that I would have to sort of summarize what some of the major themes of what you have talked about, is that is that a good summary? Is there, any, am I missing anything that you think is particularly important for me to mention? It sounds good to me. Okay, good. I don't want to misrep. I don't want to misrepresent the group. Well, so um, I think we'll we'll be wrapping up shortly. But uh, I just want to personally thank you for coming tonight and uh, giving up uh, two hours of your evening on a Thursday. I I sincerely really enjoy these sorts of conversations um, so that we can have a dialogue and I can hear what's on your mind um, and we can share our perspectives. And I really hope that you'll attend future virtual workshops and that you'll stay, you'll, you'll submit additional comments in the online survey. And if you want to uh, participate in the planning commission um, work session, because as I said, Previously, we we need you um, to be engaged so that we can, um, you know, put together the best possible code for this area. So thank you again for taking the time to be here. Um, so you know, with that, I think I think what we should do is I'm going to try to I see I'm going to try to s stop sharing if I can as I can succeed oh there we go stop sharing and I think that um, we should leave the bake breakout room which will take us back to the full group and then um, we'll be able to kind of wrap things up five or ten minutes and then you can um, go on with the rest of your evening so thanks again for being here I really appreciate it So it's good that everyone has more time. I'll be right back. Hi, Jane. Hi, Ben. How are you? I'm great. Are you done with your breakout room? Yes. And are you ready? Are you ready to report on major themes? I think so. I'm going to try. All right. I believe in you.
Okay, thanks. <laughs> We had a we had a really good discussion in our in our group. Um, some good ideas to chew on. Yeah. How many? Do you know how many breakout rooms we ended up having? I think we had three. Great. Okay. Yeah, we had three breakout rooms. And all of them should be coming back in. There's just, it takes a minute for everybody to filter back in. Okay. Thanks, Jen, for checking in on the time. I was yeah. I, at one point, I like sort of lost track of time. And then I was, and then I couldn't remember if the meeting started at six or 6.30. I had to go back and check the agenda. I followed your guys' notes. So <laughs> your Google notes. So I could okay. keep track of kind of where everybody was. Okay. Um, but then once we were getting a little closer, just wanted to follow up because I had, you know, everybody was on a different, a little bit different speed. So that's okay. That usually happens. Yeah. All right. I think we're all back. Okay, great. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you had a good discussion in your breakout room. And uh, I think what we're going to do now is just take a couple of minutes um, for the facilitators to summarize some of the major themes that uh, um, were discussed in their breakout rooms, just so that we can all hear it. We'll also be preparing summary notes of the breakout room discussion, so we can all look at those as well um, if we want to. Um, and then after we've sort of summarized major themes, I'll just remind everybody what the next steps are, and then um, we will uh, adjourn. So um, uh, how about I'll go first in terms of summarizing the major themes of my group. Um, we had a great group. Um, I think that there is a diversity of perspectives in our group on sort of the gateway plan overall, which was great, um, as well as uh, a variety of opinions on um, some of the specific uh, uh, building facade and roof um, design standards. I think one of one of the major kind of comments that came out that I found to be particularly interesting is some concern about a, a projects being able to all choose the same facade articulation standard, um, resulting in a uniform um, design of development within the gateway area, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid, um, and wanting there to be some sort of regulatory mechanism within the gateway code that could prevent that from happening. I thought that was an interesting discussion. Another thing that came up was wanting to find the right balance between um, uh, design standards to achieve quality design and the cost of requiring those standards. Costs both from a economic feasibility perspective of a developer, as well as from the perspective of a renter or an owner of those units. So wanting to find that balance um, uh, uh, with cost and quality. Um, and then we also had a, a discussion of the L Street and K Street question in the L Street Linear Park and whether that is relevant to um, the design standards that would be incorporated into the form-based code. So that's kind of a high-level summary of, um, of some of the things that we talked about in our group. So let's see. Uh, uh, Jane, do you want to go next? Sure. I, I first want to thank Matt, Melody, Moonlight, and Patricia for being so great in our group um, and giving all their opinions. Um, so we went through, we kind of scrolled through all the images so that we can kind of see and compare and, and stop when we thought there was something to say about them. And um, we also were talking a lot about the the variety and contrast and making sure there's there's something interesting. I think one of the things uh, that really stood out to me is um, uh, there was a lot of mention of what kind of character Arcata should have or this gateway area should have. And I love the the term funky vibe. So um, there were the things that kind of appealed um, had a certain look to them. And I think we'll go back through the notes that there, we were definitely calling out the numbers of the um, images. And um, some of them have a historic feel. Some of them look a little like the creamery building. 
Um, and they definitely have some sort of reference in terms of materiality or the the kind of um, maybe it's a shape or some some reference to what is there already, which I think is fantastic. We also did get to look at some of the other um, projects in a, in a more critical way too, and so we were um, we had some really good discussion about you know what's too crazy looking or what's too boring, um, and so uh, that was really helpful to hear. I think some of the things that were really desired are welcoming big windows, opportunities to have um, community building by putting entries near each other or or having those occasions where, you know, people are able to meet each other either next to their driveway or something like that. There was also um, discussion about what the sidewalk experience is like and, and the safety of that and the experience of having it um, you know, in a, in a, uh, unobstructed way as well. And so, we, um, that was fantastic as well. So, um, we did look at the building in terms of all its components, um, from looking at different roof styles and discussed colors and the different elements that are on them, sometimes pointing out that if they're useful, that's actually, or practical, those are the best kind of elements to have. Um, and you can go too far with all the decorations on them. So, um, I also would uh, second that our group talked about the affordability or the the expense of the construction as well. Um, and we talked also about local art um, being a part of the projects. And um, if there was a public art that there could be local artists um, that uh, do uh, put their work on the buildings, that would be fantastic. Um, and then I think as we move to open spaces, um, we talked a lot about how linear parks are greatly desired. Um, and actually, this is a feature that's also important for buildings, but any kind of features that provide um, overhangs or weather um, protection, uh, those are always really fantastic too. So um, in, in the parks, um, in the smaller parks um, and along the trails, if there's places and they're all linked together, that would be fantastic. We did get a few comments that, you know, um, it's great to have a square, but there's there's the main square that's really nice. And, you know, maybe it's not exactly necessary um, to have a square. It's probably better to have a um, the trail and um, and with natural features and all of those things so you could um, walk around. But, um, you know, if there is a square, it's nice if it was a little smaller than the big square and, and perhaps there's a pedestrian orientation to it as well. So um, that that's a little synopsis of what happened in our hour. We had a lot of fun looking at all the images and um, there were some great conversation. I'm sure I missed something, <laughs> but great. there it is. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. That's wonderful. Okay. And then, so our third facilitator, our third group, do you want to provide a brief summary? Yeah. And I am, I, I facilitated this group. Um, we had a slight tech power outage for Courtney. So um, I took over and was happy to do that. Really appreciated all the conversation in our group as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, we got into the design features and some of the highlights. I am not going to be able to capture everything, I'm sure, but um, we're um, just thinking about ground level garages and not wanting those all in the front and safety of those as well as design, um, just something to think about. Um, and then we did talk about different each of the balcony features and windows and varied group lines. And um, there was discussion of support for a lot of those types of features and allowing it to be varied um, and not all uniform. Um, we got into um, some of the entry types and the People did indicate they liked the idea of commercial along the ground floor and having that open and visible. Um, and um, the idea of cost also came up in our discussion and not wanting it to be, you know, if it's too costly, will developers build it? Um, and um, then one other theme was 
um, <clears throat> talking it, about the context and existing lo build, uh, locations of existing structures and how that fit into where new buildings could go and what types of features the new buildings could go could, would include. Um, especially thinking about larger buildings and, you know, having windows, looking into smaller buildings. Um, and um, then we, and we got into the open space. Um, there was uh, support for a lot of those and the linear parks and um, features, including pavilions and gazebos and that would provide coverage from, from rain and then additional, um, also landscaping um, was really like, we did talk about the idea of bringing in, you know, additional features to some of the open space, like native plant gardens and butterfly gardens, community gardens, um, and then other types of potential features uh, that came up were potential um, children's play equipment and, you know, other types of exercise features like that. Um, and then, art also um the idea of there was an example from san diego that had some of the more industrial type art you know features it looked like and um the trail in eureka that has some of those types of art features as well was mentioned so um bringing in kind of industrial type features that fed into to the area um David, anything else from my group that, that we missed, that I missed? Yeah, no, I think you covered it pretty well. Great. I think uh, the singing frogs is one of the favorite ones that I heard. Yep. The, the magic of the singing frogs. <laughs> in the existing wetlands along L Street. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thank you, Vanessa. And um, thank you, all of you, for um, participating tonight, for uh, taking the evening to share your thoughts. Um, I said in my group, and I'll say it again to everyone, uh, your um, input is needed. It's important. Uh, we can't do it without you. Um, and we really appreciate it. And so in terms of um, next steps, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have a survey. Uh, with the same content that we talked about tonight. If you have additional thoughts that you want to share, um, uh, we encourage you to use the survey to do that. Uh, the survey will close January 30th, so you have kind of a week and a half to do that if you want to. Uh, and then after that, there will be a planning commission work session on Saturday, February 11th, at which we will be sharing um, some more developed recommendations for standards related to the topics that we are talking about today, as well as building massing standards as well. So we encourage you to stay engaged and continue to participate um, as we move forward. And um, David, do, uh, would you like to uh, make some concluding remarks? Um, no, I don't have anything uh, major. I just wanted to thank everybody for you know taking the time out tonight and um, you know sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. I couldn't agree with them more that you know we are really hoping to have a, you know community design process uh, that allows folks to you know to weigh in on these decisions and to have a sense for you know what development might look like in the future. Um, so just uh, appreciations to you all and um, hope to see you at our next events, and um, we'll talk to you then. Great. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. See you soon. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, James, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, there's a lot to uh, unpack there, but I, I do find that ground level porches and patios just for community, I think in general is a good idea without seeing specifics. So it is just a little more of a concept, but I, I, I think that would be important. I mean, depending on what type of structures we're talking about and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Joe Matier. 
I find it helpful to, when we look at the um, topics to actually go to the images and see it. So when I looked at the bay windows, there were certain bay windows that I saw that just kind of popped out of the building and I felt it like was looked a little awkward. Um, I think there's one on uh, image 17. Um, I think for that if I was correct on that, but uh, like 14, there's the bay window there. Um, but you know, so that might be one way to go through. Uh, I think you know um, the different items, and then specifically look at that item as it's highlighted in the lookbook is is helpful. Great, thank you. And it looks like Courtney is jumping back on too. Um, I am so sorry, everybody. We just lost power here. <laughs> Um, and so that's why I was, I just got cut off fairly abruptly. I really apologize. I uh, wasn't expecting that. Um, I'm currently trying to, to log in via my Wi-Fi. Uh, so just bear with me. Vanessa, were you able to kind of jump in a little? Yeah. Bit? Yep. Yep. I'm oh, doing my you. best to, to get thank us you. through I'm this. So yeah. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Are there any of these features that were in the list that others, you know, stood out to others or not? Um, Should we just unmute? I see there are three of us with hands raised, including Judith. Oh, yes. Thank you. Judith. I'd love to hear from Judith. Okay. Um, that, that, picture of the townhouses with the garage doors facing the sidewalk. Um, blech. <laughs> and I, I, I think that, you know, if, if we need to have townhouses uh, with big garage doors, it would be great if they could be facing onto maybe an alley, um, which is also kind of a design feature. Yeah. Uh, where? shown in this 30 image 30 is this the one that is uh yeah the the albany one number yep. 30. um and i think that's that's the place where it's most prominent um and that's a design i would really hate to see in the gateway in arcada um and i know that it is a very standard popular approach to you know getting dense housing for single families into um, the city. It also it also makes it really difficult for pedestrians on the street and for bicycles to have all those possible cars pulling out in front of them um, from places that they can't see. So don't don't do that in Arcata. <laughs> There is an image on 37, Judith, that if we could go to that, that shows the the um, garages as well. Yeah, and you know, I, I can't see the whole lookbook if I'm also looking at the Zoom. So, you know, it's kind of one or the other. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen right now? Uh, yes. Um, you know, that may be a little bit better because they're pulled back, but then the standard that says that, you know, the building should be set close to the street is kind of overridden there. Um, but that that does make it better. Um, because it's not the prominent feature that someone on the street is going to encounter. Vanessa, we are coming up to the 15 minute interval for uh, just a reminder. Oh, thank you for that. I uh, would have about a couple minutes. In that case, can we make sure that we get to uh, Sherry and James? They've had their hands up for a while. Yep. Sherry, I think yours is up first. You want to jump on? Sorry, I can't see everyone's hands up, I guess. There we go. Oh, sorry. I apologize. And I can I can only see a few of these two. I'm on a 13 inch laptop screen. so. Um, I think this one, it looks like number 38, the Rockview in Novato. Surprisingly, it does have only one color, but 
Um, it seems like it's an interesting variation in window sizes and a couple of little um, roof lines that are interesting. It's actually not a bad building. Um, I had comments on some other ones, but I don't see them all. I think. Would it be helpful if I scroll through them? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, I did see some that I thought were really ugly and inappropriate. Um, that one that's on, I can't even see the number. It looks like Blather, Bl Blattner Hall in San Francisco. That one's rather dull. That's 133. So, so is the one, the Bay, Bay Meadows in San Mateo. Um, the building itself isn't bad, but it, if it had some varied exterior colors, it might help. The arches are nice at the street level. Great. Um, the Moran Apartments in Oakland, that's funky and awesome. <laughs> I think that looks sort of Arcata, even though it's absolutely nothing like anything we have now. And I liked this example, too, because it was, you know, a, a larger building next to some other smaller residences back here. Yeah. Well, one comment on that. I don't think a, a, a large building like that should be that close to one and two story buildings for our solar shading issue. It's maybe not on the current topic, but um, I'll let Jim go. Great. Yeah. And thanks for pointing out the features you like, you know, like these, the arches in this number 36. And so that's what, you know, it is good for us to hear kind of the features that you do do like in some of these buildings. So thank you. Yeah, there are other buildings with features that I like, but I'm only seeing six of them now. Um, I think the, okay, coming, that one coming up above 29, I mean, I seriously can't read this. Um, there were some with some windows that were arched that I thought were very interesting. Um, that Merritt Crossing in Oakland, I think that building might look okay if it were only three stories, but it has an appearance of being a three-story building stretched up to five or six. And I think this 21 Madison at Oakland, it has some horizontal lines and obviously vertical lines. Yeah, I don't know, that that looks like the city and not like, like uh, Arcata. These, um, number 24, the staircases yep. to, that's very interesting. I think 24 is really nice. I could just jump in real quick because I think it's going to be um, hard to keep in mind sort of the, the level of, um, you know, architecture that we're looking at uh, to try and weigh in. You know, this this building uh, in 21, you know, Sherry, like you said, you know, I, I, I don't see this building fitting in, in Arcata either. It does look very, you know, kind of modern. It looks like something that would belong in Oakland. But I guess the question is, you know, do you like the projecting accent lines as a way to break up the mass? You know, not necessarily in this particular application, but you know, are those attractive? You know, are the vertically oriented uh, windows and the the spacing of the windows, um, you know, something that you'd want to see, you know, given on a different type of building? Right? Um, so think, um, think about the design features. Um, yeah, I, I I think it's too repetitive. Um, the variation that you see in what looks like number 24, Scotts Valley, with the the staircases up to the and, and the the varied uh, roof lines is nice, the varied sizes of windows, and it doesn't look contrived. That's that's an interesting design. Um, Great. Thanks, Sherry. And I would like sure. to get your additional thoughts, but I want James to have a chance as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, thanks, Vanessa. Um, I actually am not sure about the original structure I was looking at. I think it might have been in Lafayette, but I'm not positive. And it, it was more of a general dis discussion about the, um, let me see where we're looking at. And the Oakland kind of offers that a little bit too, is just the, the choice and actually the, the also the brick building above. It was just more of a, a, a choice of the, um, some of the siding structures and a little bit more of an earth feel. So I do find with some of the more modern, you know, uh, things, the poppiness of it doesn't really feel 
like you would see here, you know, and once again, I think along with that, I can probably make comments about how the lines are broken up, but I think I might do most of that later, you know, revisiting this with more, more time to think things over. Yeah. And that's, I would like to point that out too. There will is time to uh, look at this on your own time and provide this similar feedback in the survey. So that will be available. Um, great. Thank you for your comments, James. And it looks like Amelia has her hand up. Yeah, uh, just real quick. Number 10 with the rounded balcony seemed pretty interesting. Um, I don't recall my memory saying something like that before, but it does feel more welcoming um, as a space for I don't know, people living in there or from looking from like the outside. Oh, this one. Yes, right here. It's that. Right. Thanks. All right. Then some of the other um, proposed standards will do have to do with, we did touch on kind of the garage entries and then Another um, aspect is ground floor frontages. Um, so we can, if we want to kind of look at those, there is would be different standards for commercial ground floors versus residential ground floors that are in some of the proposed standards um, in terms of uh, having windows that are you can see through basically for commercial uses for a certain percentage of the building and for residential uses having those um, doors that access on the public streets that's in certain distances. Um, so there are examples of, you know, this in Arcata, the residential building having um, the corner open so you can see through it. And then in example, this 19, there is, looks like commercial along the whole, this whole frontage right here on the ground floor. So are there any thoughts about those ground floor um, ground floor standards? Yes, James, I see your hand up. Um, I'm not sure what number it was, but it was the landscape built into the building facade. I mean, it, it's probably a little deliberate, but it did, I mean, have an interesting look to it. But it, when I look at it closer, it's almost got a log cabin feel to it, I don't think, but it does sort of break things up within an otherwise fairly more of a, for lack of better words, more straight mass structure. Um, that would be my main. I guess that's Walnut Creek is what it looks like. Thank you. This one, thanks. Yes, Sherry. Yeah, the interest on the siding on that number 14 makes that a very attractive building. Um, I think a lot of these commercial ground floor treatments are very interesting. I, mean, this, I would say as far as this list of examples, our own Sorrel building maybe has the least amount of interest. But this one here in 17, that breaks up the building nicely. And if you can scroll down. Yep. Thank you so much. Even our own, um, oh my goodness, this type is so small, I apologize. Even our own building right there, the three plaza point. Plaza point. Yes, yes. Yes, plaza point. Even that one, yeah, the, the commercial level on that is really nice. Um, my favorite is probably the Scotts Valley with the staircases going up. That's lovely. Great, thank you. I see a thumbs up, okay. Great. Um, one, one thing that the uh, plan calls for uh, in, in the policy side of it, the, the gateway plan that we have written so far is to have certain frontages uh, have those, those commercial ground floors, um, a, a look and feel of a commercial ground floor, regardless of the use that's going on inside the building. So, you know, it may look like, a, you know, Plaza Point, but what's happening inside might be more of a, you know, maybe it's a, a you know, an office use or, or it could even be residential. Um, do you think that breaking up that first floor, that first elevation as a design um, element 
um, and distinguishing it on the ground floor from the upper floors is, is uh, attractive. I think it's great, yeah. So we, it is uh, seven o'clock now, and it looks like we spent about uh, 24 minutes on this. Great, thank you, Jill, for keeping track of time. <laughs> um, one, if there are any, you know, brief thoughts that we didn't, some people mentioned the varied roof forms, but um, if there's, we didn't dive into it in detail. So if there are any thoughts before we move on to the open space um, component of it about varied root forms and um, ways to break that up in terms of overhanging eaves or dormers and gables or upper level step backs, um, varied roof types on buildings, um, any different modulation kind of as in this 19 up here. Yes, Sherry. Yes, thank you again. Um, even our, our very own Plaza Point, I think that's interesting with the, the cute variations. This one visible now, Scotts Valley, that's cute with the little gables. Um, dormers are always nice, definitely um, step backs and anything that's just flat like we're seeing here on Merritt Crossing in Oakland. Um, park on Powell, Emeryville, that has a lot of variation but it, it really looks kind of too urban for us. Great, thank you. Any other comments about the roof, roof lines? All right, so I think now is the time that we will move into switch gears, unless there's any kind of final thoughts on some of these things and want to reiterate that the lookbook and um, the potential standards and the intent of the standards are all available um, on the city's website and will be available. And there will be a survey posted where you can provide additional feedback to us on those, those, these, all of these things. Um, great. So now I think we are going to, to switch gears and talk about the open space. And this is just, uh, as Ben mentioned, just an initial kind of discussion on these topics, on the open space topics and different design features that you would like to see in different areas of the gateway area. And there will be additional meetings on this, um, on the open space itself. So I'm going to pull up the examples um, and then we can take it, take any feedback that you have um, right now as we go through these. Um, that the open space types that Ben did discuss earlier include the um, privately uh, accessible public open space or privately owned publicly accessible open space, um, linear parks, and then the Barrel District Community Square area. Um, so I can scroll through some of these examples and then we can take comments. Now the linear parks. Oops. Um, here's another example in San Diego. And then this one in Los Angeles. Then the other type is the Barrel District Community Square. Um, so there were a few examples. Of that. So any thoughts, comments um, about the types of features? So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, only focused on one type of, of area, but the types of features that you would like to see in terms of community gathering spaces or art or anything like that. Um, 
Yes, Sherry. I think that Hive Park looks really welcoming and nice. And I, I wonder if it might have a feel that it only belongs to the people who live in that building. Um, something like that Transamerica Park, even though there's a gate on it, or I don't know if the gate closes at a certain time, but with the fence around it, it, that looks a little bit intimidating. Otherwise, it looks like a really wonderful space that would be welcoming for anyone, um, not just residents, if these were all residential buildings surrounding the park. That's a really wonderful space. Oh, and yeah, the linear parks are fantastic. All the different types of linear parks that, that are in these examples look really good. The, um, you know, that, that particular area, I'm not sure whether it's uh, private or, or public, uh, the, the Hyde Park one. Um, but the, the idea being that, you know, is this, is this attractive? Is this design something that we like, uh, something that we could incorporate into our standards? And those would require that they would be, you know, publicly accessible through uh, easements and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a lovely design. Looks really welcoming. Great. Um, James, I see your hand up. Hi, um, I'm just wondering if the conversation stems at all into the linear parks related to public spaces, if that's possible for a discussion. I know we're trying to keep it really to the discussion of, of the privately owned spaces and just because um, I see examples in there as far as some greenway spaces and um, just I'll digress for just a minute, but hopefully to um, draw attention to the potential for like the linear park on L Street. Because yeah, that... no, we do want to hear feedback about public open space as well. And... Yeah, and, and, and I think because there's a lot of uh, potential bisecting trails that I think, you know, potentially from all the future infill that would tie in. And there's an example of like a more urban style. And I think this, the San Diego Park, I think, you know, calls a little bit to more what we have about here. But anyway, I just thought I would put that out there for a moment because I know this it's more about uh, privately owned public spaces, but we have a pretty amazing public space that could be enhanced and, and I'll stop there. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, again, this is uh, primarily about uh, design and, and the kinds of features that we want to see in Arcata. Um, and so uh, we, we want to make sure that uh, we're, we're focusing on those. The actual ownership of it is uh, less important at this point. And we've updated, based on our outreach and engagement, we've updated the gateway area plan to include you know, both uh, publicly accessible private and public spaces that are uh, owned and fee titled by the city. All right, any other thoughts on the open space, maybe? Oh, the curving lines of that linear park in LA, that was that was lovely. Um, the, the shaded aspects with lots of trees of the one in San Diego was nice too. Even the East Village in San Diego, it's, I'm sure they're limited on space over there. And yet in a limited space, you can make it look really nice. Yeah, that example there. Um, that looks like you've got about maybe 10 or 15 feet of space, but they've done a really nice job of it. All of those examples are really nice. Great, thank you. Yes, Amelia. Yeah, um, so with the Fruitvale Station, the last one, um, what was really cool about that place was like it was um like a hangout but also like when there's like like um, art events or like cultural events it was a good space to like congregate so it was like like a lot of uses and then you have like the commercial there so it, it just felt like a very like i don't want to say like centered kind of vibe um but yeah but probably more green in there great thank you Yeah, adding some lawn to a space like that would be really easy in Arcata because of all the rain we get.
Great. Um, so I forget Joe or David exactly how much time we have in these breakout rooms. Um, I think we might have another minutes. 20 minutes, right? Okay, great. Let's hear from Judith. Yeah, on on the um the the squares, the barrel district um areas, there's a real contrast between the fruit veil and the and the other one and uh the one that actually had cars and parking in it. Yeah, that one. And it really highlights how valuable it would be to have that as a pedestrian oriented space. Um, rather than, you know, giving over much of that public space to to cars. Um, and, you know, you could still keep it so that emergency vehicles and, you know, special use vehicles can have access to it, um, but that it, it really isn't a car space. Great. Thank you. Can I see, Jeanette, you're listening and you're wel more than welcome to keep listening, but if you do have any, any comments to throw out there, feel free. We would love to hear it. I'll scroll through these one more time. James, yes. Um, they're looking, I can't remember which one it was, but the, if the space was there, the, the pavilion within the linear park is kind of a, a nice space, especially with Arcata with the varying weather. You know, obviously that's shading from sun, but serves as a, um, just some one thought on that. I mean, obviously it's what jumped out at me. I mean, besides all the landscaping. Um, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I like that a lot also. Great. All right. And I'm happy to pull up. Um, we can keep talking about. Um, here's the ones at the beginning. I haven't been back to in a bit. Um, open space. And I. We can also go back to the lookbook if anyone has thought of anything or wants to add anything um, to that discussion. Um, I was just going to ask for clarification on the pavilion. There's two pavilions. One is in the linear park and one is in the like a barrel district example. And so I was just trying to flush out the comments from the previous uh, attendees. Uh, they like the pavilion, does it matter where it's at versus like a linear park in the one setting or the barrel district one, you know, more of a gathering place with more public people or just public members. Uh, I think a linear park, you kind of meet people on a park and whereas if, if it's a, a center like a barrel district, it's more of a purposely gathered spot. So if there's any comments on that, I'd like to hear that. Um, yeah, my reference, Joe, was definitely to the linear park setting, and I, I, for me, I sort of saw it on what was a, a greenway there, and obviously a potential gathering spot, you know, and depending on the situation and, and the flow, it could be a, a gathering spot that doesn't necessarily have to be a center point. And that was my thought of on that linear park. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, Sherry, yes. Yeah, regarding that pavilion on the linear park, I think we have a gathering space like that right now in front of our, our creamery building. And if there was a covered pavilion right there, we already have a gathering space there. To have it covered would be 
fantastic. Also the gazebo in the center of a larger space. Um, absolutely, that's great. Great, thank you. And James and Sherry, you still have your hands up, but I just want, if you have additional comments, feel free to make them. <laughs> Thank you. I like just about all of it. <laughs> Open space. All right. <laughs> so would you like to... Continue to talk about open space, or I think we do have a couple more minutes. We can go back to the lookbook um, and take another look at that, um, or any of the um, text of the standards themselves, some proposals, the intent of those standards. Um, let me make sure we covered. We kind of touched on um, building entries. So, yes, Sherry. Um, regarding these outdoor spaces, can we get as specific now as to request something such as a butterfly garden or a native plant garden or um, songbird garden? I think now is the time to bring those up, um, you know, and, and think about how we can incorporate those potential types of features. Yeah. Great. Thanks. make sure I get that. I was just going to mention on the San Diego, I believe that's a linear park. It looks like they have, um, you know, artifacts from the industry. And so I think that like the barrel district, if it incorporated some of the, the features from there, or, you know, I, I just think that those add interest to that linear park. And so I thought that was a interesting aspect. I don't know what other folks feel about that, if that would be helpful for linear parks. See some thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, I would say this is a, a great time uh, to your point, Sherry, about, um, you know, what's appropriate to, to mention here. This is a great time to, you know, list anything that, you know, uh, you know, tickles your fancy and, you know, to, to add that to the list and, you know, we can communicate that to the decision makers. Um, you know, it's really a, a time to be able to, you know, convey uh, the kinds of things that, you know, we'd like to see in our community, you know, as we grow and, and develop. So, yeah, anything, uh, you know, I love the idea of the butterfly garden and the, the songbird garden. Those are those are great concepts that we can use to help emphasize as development comes in to, to tell them the types of um, things that we want to see. How about um, peach trees, apple trees, um, community vegetable gardens? Right. Oh, and James, you had your hand up for a minute, but I don't see it up anymore. So go ahead if you have another comment. Um, yeah, I don't think it's necessarily to add in individual features right now, but maybe just more curious where the subject of open spaces might come up again that might be more related to the overall plan. It, is that another another time that that might be discussed or? Um, I mean, if you have a comment, lay it on us, Jim. Um, I, well, it was, it was stated earlier, and I, I, um, I guess I'll just give you the, the spiel that I've given to City Council, and it, uh, we've, we've been petitioning a lot of people who have, an in, have shown an interest um, in the actual linear park uh, along the bike path, and I know it's something that's a huge contention point right now, but um, it also has been endorsed by the, uh, the local Sierra Club, and I realize once again, I apologize because this isn't the forum for it, but I, I feel like the open space discussion just begs it a little bit. And so beyond that, I will give I will come back to this at another time when we're looking and looking at mass and everything else and 
give you more individual options and ideas related to, the, to what you're presenting with Linear Park. Anyway, thanks for that moment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Some children's play equipment or fitness equipment along a linear path would be nice too. And one of the concepts that we've been uh, sort of kicking around recently is, you know, as a community amenity, the idea is that some of them can be really broad, like, you know, we'd like to see as many uh, net zero buildings as possible. And so that could be a community amenity that people could select into their building type um, with uh, but then there are some location specific community amenities, you know, where the car wash is, if that gets developed, it would be great to see it daylight the creek, for example, um, along L Street, along the, the um, you know, the trail there, um, you know, we could expand this linear park concept by having projects that develop along the trail, um, you know, again, give easements or, you know, create some uh, publicly accessible private open space onto those properties so we can expand the the footprint, it might be little pop outs here and there where you could have those kinds of, you know, play equipment or exercise equipment or, you know, chess tables or, or those kinds of things. Um, so that's something that we've been sort of kicking around and exploring with people. Does anybody have any thoughts or, or comments about that as a, a possibility? You see a thumbs up? Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Um, yeah, with like some of the low lying features, and I know they exist other places. I'm assuming bocce ball courts have probably been thrown around, <laughs> and so I'll come up with a few more later. But anyway, that just came to mind, and and I know that a lot of you hear a lot from the uh, parks and rec. There's a certain faction of people who'd love to see skate features and and things like that. So those are the two that come to mind, and I'll think of more later. Thanks. Great, thanks, Sherry. Yeah, to get really specific, um, the little wetland that's on L Street with a bunch of singing frogs at night, that's really amazing. And if you're biking by there or walking at night to hear that, it just puts you in heaven. So preserving that specific uh, wetland, if I could add that to the notes, that would be great. Take it, take it all ideas. Um, Amelia or Jeanette, do you um, have some thoughts or ideas you want to share? Yeah. Jim, did you have something else or? Your hands just still up. All right. I'm going to advocate for utilitarian art. Um, the, if you've seen the steampunk uh, stuff along the, the trail in Eureka on the waterfront trail, they've had an artist do uh, benches and sitting things. And then there's the Native American um, stumps that they're made out of concrete, you know, so incorporating certain things and themes like that along those linear parks, I think would be a nice by, by advocate for that, he means he's throwing that out as an idea for folks to comment on. Since <laughs> the lines. <laughs> That's a great idea. Great. Well, we really appreciate everything that we're hearing tonight and um, all future thoughts that you have as well. Um, we look forward to people taking the survey and getting feedback that way. And also, you know, speaking to the planning commissioners and um, continuing to be part of this process. Um, so we really appreciate everyone being here and providing your thoughts. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I don't know if we're quite wrapping up yet, but I did want to make sure that we said that. <laughs> um, so um, maybe the time is wearing on everything. I assume we're just going to be popped back, give a one minute warning and pop back into the main room. Um, but it might be five more minutes. So we can, David, were you going to say something? 
Yeah, I was just going to say, I'll check in on time, but I, I liked your idea earlier, Vanessa, maybe going back to the, um, the architecture and seeing if, you know, if we can go slowly through those and maybe, you know, comment on each one. And maybe if you zoom in a little bit so people can. Yeah. And maybe I'll start at the bottom because I don't know if I got all the way down there. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> then I'll, I'll check in on time. Joe, you, you might go. take over the, um, the notes. I know you and I, I think have been playing back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Oops, oops, I went too fast. Okay, so we're gonna I'm gonna start at the bottom and this is the last page if, when you do look at this yourself. So obviously here are the numbers. Um is that zoomed in a good good amount for people to see a little better? Um <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um so I will um I think one thing that we didn't necessarily get super in depth into was um, to talk about some of the building entrance um, features. And so anything, any feedback on those, um, we did talk about, you know, the difference between ground floor frontages for residential and non-residential uses, but actual um, entries, if they should be, you know, uh, street facing, public street facing or um, accessed from from other places along along the right of ways. And I'm gonna scroll, just scroll slowly and feel free to stop me or um, try to keep my eye out for if you raise your hand or throw out a comment. I think on those first four um, buildings that are all visible at the very bottom, I think they all have they all have lots of points of interest and especially the street facing entries. It really serves to break up a big building. Great. Thanks. Yeah, the overall feel of the townhouses in Lafayette, I think it's a combination of the entries, um, just a lot of uniqueness as far as the position of windows and then just the overall feel of the materials. I'm guessing it probably wouldn't be, I don't know if that's stucco or if there's a lot of actual, but it, it just in overall has a nice feel to it. Um, so probably a lot of things to take away from that. Great. You have lots of different materials and modulation and colors. All right, thank you. Yes, Judith. Yeah, um, just on those four pictures that you put up on the screen, but as well as on some of the others, even a little bit of landscaping um, around those buildings in context, even, you know, three feet of landscaping off the sidewalk makes a huge difference in terms of the, the good feeling of the design. Um, the, the, the walls and windows right on that sidewalk, um, just doesn't have as inviting a feel to it as, um, the plantings. And so that like that, the latitude in San Jose, um, versus the slate in San Mateo, um, and even the street trees on that Brown Avenue townhomes picture um, ha has a much um, more lively and um, living sense to it than the big walls and the concrete sidewalk. All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to keep keep scrolling. Over. So I checked in and we have uh, about 15 more minutes. Okay. 
We've got plenty of, time, plenty of time for either, you know, going through these items or, you know, lots of uncomfortable silence, whatever we choose. <laughs> Thanks for checking. <laughs> Can I say the the CCA Blattner Hall in San Francisco, it does have a lot of variation. Um, it still seems a little boxy. If they had some different roof lines, that would be nice. I do like their their um, ground floor entry though. It, it really, it makes a difference. And then that other funky one above that in Oakland, I could, it, I could see something like that in the creamery. You know, why not? <laughs> Um, what 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 specifically, Sherry, do you like about that building? I mean, I've got I like that building too, and I've got a couple of things that I like about it. But what's what's attractive to you about that? Um, the different materials on the the little um, decks that they have there, mm -hmm. the what looks like hubcaps, the decor, it looks kind of funky. There's different sized windows. There is the different looking commercial entry on the first floor that breaks it up. And there are vertical lines, like the the blue vertical lines, they're not uniform. You know, there's, looks like there's three of them on, on the left side of the building, and then there's more blue vertical lines, but they're, they're varying in width. Mm -hmm. All of those things. Yep. It kind of reminds me of the houses that Cash designed up on uh, A Street. There's something about it that is reflective of those, if, if anybody's familiar. I'm not familiar. Some of these features look like they would be costly. And I wonder how likely we are to get anything this interesting or funky throwing out out there yeah we we definitely need to um you know have broader conversations around that i mean i think you know we're going to have to balance you know the design elements that we really want to see with you know making sure that we actually you know get get the development that we want to see as well um you know to, to meet our housing needs and whatnot um I've had you know different different architects I've talked to have different opinions uh, on this subject, and um, you know, I was recently speaking with Julian Berg, and I was kind of you know lamenting that you know we may not get as as wonderful a designs as you know as we like out of out of these buildings, and he's he tended to think that you know you could have a building like this Moran Apartments uh, without too much additional cost. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, there, there are going to be areas where it's going to be really important, you know, main, you know, like on K Street, you know, where it's our main drive or L Street, if that's, you know, converted to a main drive, you know, where you have main commercial corridors where it's going to be important to have, you know, heightened attention to design. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we, we want to make sure that we can, you know, convey that in our codes. Um, you know, but still, still recognizing we want to, you know, balance those and, and, you know, and to some extent, you know, is it important enough to us to have, you know, something that's architecturally spectacular, you know, and we would accept that as, you know, part of the amenities. I mean, there are some, some things in the, you know, community benefits program right now that folks have looked at and said, hey, that, that looks like something that, you know, should, you know, just be part of the project. You know, for instance, there's, um, you know, rapid production of housing is listed in the, the gateway plan right now. And some people look at that and say, well, you know, why are we giving that away as a benefit? Um, and I guess, you know, the answer that, that I've given um, and, you know, what the decision makers still need to weigh is that, you know, if we really want to incentivize housing, creating it as a benefit is a way to do that. Um, and maybe that's not, you know, how we want to use that. But similarly with architectural design, you know, you could say, well, we want all of our buildings to look beautiful. And if we find that, you know, that's going to make all of our buildings way too expensive for, you know, people to live in, then maybe we say, well, we want these buildings to look beautiful and we're, we're going to accept a lower architectural standard on, you know, on these other buildings over, you know, located over here. Well, I think specifically next to the Creamery building, because it's such a, a unique um, landmark in our town, mm -hmm. that 
maybe specifying anything that's next to it, not be really off the charts funky like the Moran apartments there, but maybe incorporate brick, you know, something that's more um, from the time when the creamery was built, such as the, I think we're looking at brick there on Studio Walk in Hayward. And overall, that's kind of a boring building, but the brick at least would seems like it would fit next to the creamery. Mm -hmm. I'm just checking in with your group to see kind of where you're at. I just checked in with the other two groups. It sounds like you guys have started to do open space or you've already gone through open space. Yep, we've already gone through open space and we, we circled back. Then you circled back. Okay, yeah. that's great. That's great. I'm <laughs> thinking I will reconvene the groups around 745. Does that sound like it will work for, for you all? Okay. Yep. All right. Sounds good. I'll be back then and, and bring you all back at 745. Thanks. Uh, so Sherry, you had mentioned before we leave this one, Vanessa, you had mentioned earlier the idea of having, you know, this, you know, the Moran is this large scale. It looks like it's five stories, maybe to me, right next to a two story. The one right next to it, this uh, Lin Way. What do you all think about, you know, the step down that that has? It looks like maybe a two or maybe three story on the, you know, backside, and then it bumps up to a four and maybe even a five story on the corner. Well, I think the form based code should be really site specific for that, considering the the shading of the existing buildings. Yeah. I know this is a Lamborghini. Does that look like a, a reasonable strategy for uh, you know having that kind of step down as you get closer to existing development? Yeah, if the three stories can be on the north side of the block, if there are one stories north of that, definitely. Um, if it's okay to jump in, yeah, I would just uh, concur with Sherry. It would just depend on a lot the art articulation of the existing structures. But yeah, I, 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 the concept of the stepping down and stepping back, you know, that's one way in the look of that that would could suffice. Great. Others have feelings, opinions, ideas about that, Judith? Yeah. Uh, if, if you are going to be stepping down like that. It, there's a contextual thing that the code could do. It It's probably a good thing not to have the wall facing the, the much lower structures as just a blank wall. Um, but you also don't want to have huge windows looking directly into um, the smaller structures, you know, bathrooms and living rooms and bedrooms. And, and so they're, they're, could be a kind of a contextual part of the code um, that that would let builders avoid building, you know, something that existing smaller structure occupants are just going to find horrific and offensive. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm, th there could even be something in there about color. I, you know, you wouldn't want someone building a big black wall facing directly onto your, you know, lightest windows, and and literally kind of cutting off the reflective light. So, you might also not want a big place for someone's advertising to be the only thing that you see out of your living room or bedroom window. Great. Yeah. And the, you know, some of the standards will address or can address, you know, how big, how big blank walls can be and can't be. Um, and what I'm hearing that it is also, you know, contextual and depends on where it is and what it's next to. So, great, thanks. <clears throat> All right, should I keep scrolling or any additional comments on these ones? We'll keep going, I think, but feel free. We'll try to look at raised hands too. Um, Uh, 
So, yes. James, is your hand still raised or do you have a comment? All right. Sherry, go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to give a huge thumbs up to our very own um, bittersweet building. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's one of the, the most fun places stylistically and a gathering point where people are outside, even if it's freezing cold, it's so attractive. Um, um, the, the roof lines of all the gables and the different windows that we see on that Albany, is that something yeah, that the townhouses? Yeah. Number 30. Yeah. Yeah. Those, those are, those are all right. You know, they're, they're better than a big block. Like we see here at the glass house lofts in Emeryville. I think um, books are starting to break in the other rooms. We have one room that's broken um, and one room that hasn't. I just wanted to check in with folks and see, you know, we can keep going for another couple of minutes. Are you ready to join back the other group? What do we, what do people think? Are there opinions or? James? Um, I'm fine either way at this point. Great. Okay. Any last thoughts people want to get out there before we before we break into the other room? Um, just one more overall feel. The I believe it was the loft. I want to say it was a Lafayette structure. I don't know now, but it was definitely those textures to me and just the overall feel that I think and Judith mentioned about just that level of landscaping overall. It just, I think a lot could be taken away from that structure. It was, I think it was online with, um, wait, I think we passed it. Uh, it's all moving too fast. <laughs> I think it was, I think it was like 37 or something. Okay. I don't know. Uh, let me see, or maybe, no, that's not it. No, that definitely isn't it. Uh, Here it is, 39, I think. Uh, this one, 39. Oh, uh, yeah, that was it. That, yeah, I just ran out of there. But, but anyway, that's a more general overall feel. I think they get a lot of things right there. Um, you know, even though my favorite structure is a craftsman, but we're talking about big buildings. So, um, yeah. That would be my last thought on that. Thank you. And once again for uh, facilitating this. Yes, thank you for all your comments. It says we have 30 seconds and we're leaving. We're going to be popped back in. So Sherry, were you going to say one last thing? Yeah, I was going to say thank you very, very much. This has been lots of fun. And again, Jim brought up Craftsman. So yeah, I love Craftsman and Victorian. That goes with our town. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for participating and your feedback. And we are now about to regroup into the main room. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Hi. Um, but then once we were getting a little closer, just wanted to follow up because I had, you know, everybody was on a different, a little bit different speed. So that's okay. That usually happens. Yeah. All right, I think we're all back. Okay, great. So welcome back everybody. Um, I hope you had a good discussion in your breakout room. And uh, I think what we're going to do now is just take a couple of minutes um, for the facilitators to summarize some of the major themes that uh, um, were discussed in their breakout rooms, just so that we can all hear it. We'll also be preparing summary notes of the breakout room discussion. So we can all look at those as well um, if we want to. Um, and then after we've sort of summarized major themes, I'll just remind everybody what the next steps are and then um, we will uh, adjourn. So um, uh, how about I'll go first in terms of summarizing the major themes of my group. Um, we had a great group. Um, I think that there is a diversity of perspectives in our group on sort of the gateway plan overall, which was great, um, as well as uh, a variety of opinions on um, some of the specific uh, uh, building facade and roof um, design standards. I think one of one of the major kind of comments that came out that I found to be particularly interesting 
is some concern about a, a projects being able to all choose the same facade articulation standard, um, resulting in a uniform um, design of development within the gateway area, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid, um, and wanting there to be some sort of regulatory mechanism within the gateway code that could prevent that from happening. I thought that was an interesting discussion. Another thing that came up was wanting to find the right balance between um, uh, design standards to achieve quality design and the cost of requiring those standards. Costs both from a economic feasibility perspective of a developer, as well as from the perspective of a renter or an owner of those units. So wanting to find that balance um, uh, uh, with cost and quality. Um, and then we also had a, a discussion of the L Street and K Street question in the L Street Linear Park and whether that is relevant to um, the design standards that would be incorporated into the form-based code. So that's kind of a high-level summary of, um, of some of the things that we talked about in our group. So let's see, uh, uh, Jane, do you want to go next? Sure. I, I first want to thank Matt, Melody, Moonlight, and Patricia for being so great in our group um, and giving all their opinions. Um, so we went through, we kind of scrolled through all the images so that we can kind of see and compare and, and stop when we thought there was something to say about them. And um, we also were talking a lot about the the variety and contrast and making sure there's there's something interesting. I think one of the things uh, that really stood out to me is um, uh, there was a lot of mention of what kind of character Arcata should have or this gateway area should have. And I love the the term funky vibe. So um, there were the things that kind of appealed um, had a certain look to them. And I think we'll go back through the notes that there, we were definitely calling out the numbers of the um, images. And um, some of them have a historic feel. Some of them look a little like the creamery building. Um, and they definitely have some sort of reference in terms of materiality or the the kind of um, maybe it's a shape or some some reference to what is there already, which I think is fantastic. We also did get to look at some of the other um, projects in a, in a more critical way too, and so we we're um, we had some really good discussion about you know what's too crazy looking or what's too boring, um, and so uh, that was really helpful to hear. I think some of the things that were really desired are welcoming big windows, opportunities to have um, community building by putting entries near each other or or having those occasions where, you know, people are able to meet each other either next to their driveway or something like that. There was also um, discussion about what the sidewalk experience is like and, and the safety of that and the experience of having it um, you know, in a, in a, uh, unobstructed way as well. And so, we, um, that was fantastic as well. So, um, we did look at the building in terms of all its components, um, from looking at different roof styles and discussed colors and the different elements that are on them, sometimes pointing out that if they're useful, that's actually, or practical, those are the best kind of elements to have. Um, and you can go too far with all the decorations on them. So, um, I also would uh, second that our group talked about the affordability or the the expense of the construction as well. Um, and we talked also about local art um, being a part of the projects. And um, if there was a public art that there could be local artists um, that uh, do uh, put their work on the buildings, that would be fantastic. Um, and then I think as we move to open spaces, um, we talked a lot about how linear parks are greatly desired. Um, and actually, this is a feature that's also important for buildings, but any kind of features that provide um, overhangs or weather um, protection, uh, those are always really fantastic too. So um, in, in the parks, um, in the smaller parks um, and along the trails, if there's places and they're all linked together, 
that would be fantastic. We did get a few comments that, you know, um, it's great to have a square, but there's, there's the main square that's really nice. And, you know, maybe it's not exactly necessary um, to have a square. It's probably better to have a, um, the trail and, um, and with natural features and all of those things so you could um, walk around. But, um, you know, if there is a square, it's nice if it was a little smaller than the big square and, and perhaps there's a pedestrian orientation to it as well. So um, that that's a little synopsis of what happened in our hour. We had a lot of fun looking at all the images and um, there was some great conversation. I'm sure I missed something, <laughs> but great. there it is. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. That's wonderful. Okay. And then, so our third facilitator, our third group, do you want to provide a brief summary? Yeah. And I, and I, I facilitated this group. Um, we had a slight tech power outage for Courtney. So um, I took over and was happy to do that. Really appreciated all the conversation in our group as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, we got into the design features and some of the highlights. I am not going to be able to capture everything, I'm sure, but um, we're um, just thinking about ground level garages and not wanting those all in the front and safety of those as well as design, um, just something to think about. Um, and then we did talk about different each of the balcony features and windows and varied group lines. And um, there was discussion of support for a lot of those types of features and allowing it to be varied um, and not all uniform. Um, we got into um, some of the entry types and the People did indicate they liked the idea of commercial along the ground floor and having that open and visible. Um, and um, the idea of cost also came up in our discussion and not wanting it to be, you know, if it's too costly, will developers build it? Um, and um, then one other theme was um, <clears throat> talking it, about the context and existing lo build, uh, locations of existing structures and how that fit into where new buildings could go and what types of features the new buildings could go could, would include, um, especially thinking about larger buildings and, you know, having windows, looking into smaller buildings. Um, and um, then we and we got into the open space. Um, there was uh, support for a lot of those and the linear parks and um, features, including pavilions and gazebos, and that would provide coverage from from rain and then additional um, also landscaping. Um, was really like we did talk about the idea of bringing in you know additional features to some of the open space like native plant gardens and butterfly gardens, community gardens, um, and then other types of potential features um, that came up were potential um, children's play equipment and, you know, other types of exercise features like that. Um, and then art also. Um, the idea of there was an example from San Diego that had some of the more industrial type art, you know, features it looked like, and um, the trail in Eureka that has some of those types of art features as well was mentioned. So um, bringing in kind of industrial type features that fed into to the area. Um, David, anything else from my group that, that we missed, that I missed? Yeah, no, I think you covered it pretty well. Great. I think uh, the singing frogs is one of the favorite ones that I heard. Yep. The, the magic of the singing frogs. In the existing wetlands along L Street. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thank you, Vanessa. And... Um, Thank you, all of you, for um, participating tonight, for uh, taking the evening to share your thoughts. Um, I said in my group, and I'll say it again to everyone, uh, your um, input is needed. It's important. Uh, we can't do it without you. 
um, and we really appreciate it. And so in terms of um, next steps, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have a survey uh, with the same content that we talked about tonight. If you have additional thoughts that you wanna share, um, uh, we encourage you to use the survey to do that. Uh, the survey will close January 30th. So you have kind of a week and a half to do that if you want to. Uh, and then after that, there will be a planning commission work session on Saturday, February 11th, at which we will be sharing um, some more developed recommendations for standards related to the topics that we are talking about today, as well as building massing standards as well. So we encourage you to stay engaged and continue to participate um, as we move forward. And um, David, do, uh, would you like to uh, make some concluding remarks? Um, no, I don't have anything uh, major. I just wanted to thank everybody for you know taking the time out tonight and um, you know sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. I couldn't agree with them more that you know we are really hoping to have a, you know community design process uh, that allows folks to you know to weigh in on these decisions and to have a sense for you know what development might look like in the future. Um, so just uh, appreciations to you all and um, hope to see you at our next events, and um, we'll talk to you then. Great. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. See you soon. Good evening, everyone. How are, how's everyone doing? Um, we'll start with a little bit of introduction. Um, I think it seems like most people have joined and I think we can get started. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Jane. Um, I am an architect and I'm your facilitator today. And I'm really happy to um, meet you all. And I'm gonna pass this off to um, my note taker, Gillen. Hi. Yeah, I'm Gillen. Uh, I'm a community development specialist with Arcata. Um, I operate our tenant-based rental assistance program, which is HUD-funded monthly rental assistance for primarily seniors and houseless folks here in Arcata. Um, and I will pass it to our planning commissioner, Matt. Hi, everyone. Uh, Matt Simmons, uh, newly appointed planning commissioner for the city. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, should I popcorn someone? Sure. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I'll do Melody. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Melody Meyer. Um, I live in Arcata, and I am a attorney for the Yurok tribe. Then um, Patricia, would you introduce yourself? Sorry, I'm at work, so I'm going to keep my camera off. Um, okay. My name is Patricia. Um, I've been following the Gateway and um, project, and I live within the Gateway, so it's uh, extra um, interesting to me to see how where it goes. Great. Thanks for joining us and multitasking. Okay. Um, and M. McCumber. Hi, I'm Moonlight McCumber. I'm just a Arcata resident interested in the details. Thank you. Great. We have a lot of details today. And then, John, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself again. I'm, I'm John Miller. I may be in the wrong room or there's not enough breakout rooms for me to take notes, but I may listen in just, just in case. All right. Well, you're welcome here as well. I think um, we planned for more rooms. And, and so I think what they did was just consolidate. So um, what's great is there's uh, four of you that or hoping to get feedback from. So you can say as much as you'd like, and we'll be recording that. And what we want to do is go over some of the materials that were just shared so we can have a, a, a more detailed conversation about it. I know sometimes um, when we're talking about design, we really want to uh, get people's opinions, and this is going to be fantastic for that. I just want to also um, put in the chat here this is um, the link to the outreach that is going on and all the materials that I'm showing you today. So you can always look at that afterwards. Um, and if you, if you find it easier just to look at things um, 
on your own without the share screen, feel free to do it that way too. But what I'm going to do now is um, go to the lookbook. Is everyone seeing this okay? Um, okay, great. So this is um, this is the this is a lot of a lot more images than what was shown. In fact, there's 42 pages here. We will not be going through all of these, but just wanted to make sure that. Um, it's quite clear what um, there's so much language, architectural language that goes with this. So we have put together, you know, a, a little companion, the lookbook to describe things like, you know, contrasting materials or ground floor entries and projecting bay windows, for example, in that first image. But um, since this is sort of... Um, you know, the, we'd love to hear your reactions to the kinds of things that we're showing here and what you think is what you'd like to see in the gateway area and what you don't want to see in the gateway area. And my only caveat is that the, the shape and size of the buildings are likely dictated by zoning. And what we're really looking at is like the architectural details that are um, part of the building. So um, they include the facade the building entries, roof forms, windows, and doors. There are all those many things, but I think we'll, instead of, instead of trying to remember all of those, we'll do a little bit of just looking at the facade. So for these three images that you see here, um, is there anything that stands out to you that is something that you'd love to see also in the gateway area? And if you'd like, I can also, um, zoom in to anyone. Me Melody. Yeah, I I like the contrasting uh, materials. I especially like the way the, the wooden or more natural materials look. Um, and I do like the um, different colors. I think um, a colorful facade is, is really pleasing to look at. Great. Fantastic. Any other opinions? Sometimes it's easier to say what you don't like as well. So <laughs> um, anything here, especially in the facade articulation, which is basically the design of the facade, the outside of the building, um, is there anything that you wouldn't want to see in the gateway area? And since there's only a four of us, feel free to just jump in. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I don't see it listed, but they talked about it. Uh, the ground floor entrances at pretty frequent intervals, I think, are important. You know, when you're just as a pedestrian walking along, just there's a big difference between just a wall or even, you know, open glass windows, but there's no way to enter. Um, I think that those entrances are important. Excellent. Okay. You know, maybe this is easier if we see more images as well. So I'm just kind of, I will um, go through, there's a lot of different looks in here in the lookbook uh, on purpose so that there's a variety to react to. And uh, again, I want to just ask, you know, thanks for saying something about the building entries. Is there more that you think is um, something you'd like to see in the gateway area about building entries or roofs? or windows. Um, these are three pretty different buildings. So any any thoughts that you have about the design features that you see here? I like the rounded corner building element. And um, is there a way to see them? It's a little hard to see them because they're really tiny. Almost. Okay, you know what? I'm going to maybe try to expand them as much as possible. And um, here we go. Is that better? Yes. Yes, that's much better. Thank you. Great. And then maybe since I have this scrolling way to do it, um, if there's anything else that you, I'll just kind of go slowly through it. Yes, Matt. Yeah. So this might be a little bit antithetical to what a form-based code is, but I actually really like a diversity of building types. Right. And like seeing like a building like that top one next to a building like that third one 
I find appealing as like someone walking through a, a place, right? I don't want it all to be sort of the same building over and over again. Uh, and so I don't know how to encourage that in the form-based code, but I guess I would want to make sure the code doesn't make that impossible to do. That's a really good point. Um, thanks for making it. And then um, M. McCumber. Sorry, is it Moonlight? Yes, it's Moonlight. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. I like the balconies uh, a lot. And I know, it, I, I guess on the bottom one, it's a Juliet balcony. Um, I just think that's very, un the balconies in general are wonderful. And then having that type of specialized, uh, unique type of balcony is also uh, um, attractive. Great. Um, Patricia. Um, yeah, I, I gravitate to the bottom one as well that's in Petaluma. Um, I just like the historic um, kind of features of it. Um, it, it kind of seems like it fits into some of our um, buildings that we have on the plaza. So, okay. and, um, yeah, and I like the balconies too. And even the one up, um, the middle one, um, has some nice kind of historic features. But um, again, I think the if you could add balconies to it, it would be great. I like the one next door to it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's a new one or not, but anyways. It's likely not. Um, <laughs> but let's let's keep going. I feel like we're getting warmed up and it's all about opinions and, you know, especially, you know, focus on the design of buildings. So I'm just going to kind of scroll through these three. And if anything becomes interesting to um, target as a topic of conversation about the building um, design elements, that'd be great. And some other things that we could cover are windows and doors and their design. I love that um, balconies were brought up here. There's also stoops um, and there's also um, shading devices on this one. So, or maybe they're not shading, but they're, they're um, awnings over the windows. Um, so yeah, any opinions about the materials or the way the building's expressed would be really helpful for us. And we are taking those. These really do help us um, consider what standards to write. Um, I, I like the shading or the awnings over the windows. And um, I, I also like the, the different types of uh, roof styles that I think that were featured on the previous page. I, I think it's like the multiple intersecting, I think is what it was called. Inter yeah, um, I think it's nice. Um, I think as someone else said to have like a variety. I liked all of the buildings on this page actually. Okay, great. Yeah, it's always um, something to consider. There's a lot of different changes in the roof form here versus here there's, it's just flat. And so, um, and then there's some different changes here, but yeah, Patricia. Um, yeah, I tend to gravitate to the um, buildings on the previous page um, as well. I kind of find that the um, the styles of that that next page kind of uh, are a little bit generic, and you see it a lot now. Um, I think they're referred to a lot of times as mixed stumpies. So, um, but because um, I just I just I'm mean, personal taste, I like the kind of a little bit more feature and design um, that would fit into our arcade a little bit better if they had a little bit of a, of a historic feel. Uh, that's just me. <laughs> no, that's great. It's good to know. Thanks. And Moonlight? Uh, yeah, on the previous page, the first one we were looking at, um, I also noticed on the middle one, kind of looks re reminiscent of the creamery building itself a little bit. And so that kind of made me think that that would fit that type of design might fit in that area close to the creamery building and that also it seemed like there were a variety of different entrances oh yes at the bottom yeah here. and I, I thought that was that was very um um interesting as well could you let me know what um feature or of the creamery that you think is really um, sticking out here because I'm not as familiar as with it as you are. So um, how would you, what would you describe as the familiar feature? I don't know. It just, 
I, I just, it just kind of looked like it would fit. That That's all. It's just sort of the, I guess, I don't know, the rooftop variety or just, it just kind of, maybe the windows, the the tall windows kind of look uh, okay. very, uh, it just looked very creamery district-y. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, Patricia, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think um, Moonlight um, is probably has in her her mind the top of the creamery. Uh, the creamery building has like a really interesting. Um, it's not. I don't need. I, I don't know. I'm the word for it on the top, the very top of the building, um, like a, a cornice, room. or yeah, the goes, edge of the roof. It goes across the full, you know the full length of the rooftop has a really interesting design. So it, it does, it does look a lot like the, the old historic creamery. And I know there's a building across the street from the creamery um, that houses, um, oh, is it Pacific Builders? And they um, purposely mimic that same detail that the creamery, just the creamery building had. So. I is it kind of like the neighbor here in the way that the, the roof edge is, um, or the porch edge is expressed. Is that similar? No, it's on the very top. The very, oh, very okay. Top the like building. a pitch. Uh, yeah, it kind of okay. has a really interesting like um, triangle details, and then and then they have like you can actually walk along the top. They have an open rooftop. So, oh, cool! Uh, All right. So, so, parapet is that what it's called? Um. Yeah, the parapet is usually like something where there is like the front of the building or the front wall is a little taller and you don't see the roof. And that yeah. could be that what's happening here too. So some of this could be taller than, than um, I could imagine there might be a rooftop something there, but um, yeah. yeah. I know the, so the creamery has a parapet. I guess that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. I know the, the architectural words and language don't worry too much describe what you can. Um, I always find that there's many different words to describe all the different pieces, but I'm going to keep scrolling through and we'll we'll just do this a little bit more. There are many, many pages of this. You can almost think th of this as a tour of all the different kinds of um, design that's out there. And, and a lot of these are from the Bay Area and they are just a big variety. And so as I go through these, um, if there's something that stands out as something that you're like, I never want to see this here or whatever. Okay, Matt. Well, so I have a question and it might be beyond the scope of this meeting, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming all these different design types have sort of different baked in costs. And one of the goals of the gateway is to have affordable housing and affordable units. And so I'm, and there's no info on this pretty book, right? It's like, you're yeah. looking at like, a per, in a perfect world, if you could just choose anything you wanted, but I'm, I don't know, I'm just, I'm throwing yes. it out there as a thing for us all to think about. It's a good point because, you know, something that is curvy like this may cost differently than doing something where the edges are straight. And of course, when you look at all this glass and metal, that is likely more expensive than doing stucco. So, you know, there's there's these kinds of considerations. However, you know, the the code applies to many, like this doesn't look like it's very inexpensive to build, but the code will likely apply to a, a big range and a long time frame. So um so in a way, when we look at these projects, um, we will likely have to consider all the different um projects from ones that have smaller budgets to bigger ones. So um, in a way, our code helps us bring the, the level of architectural expression either up from something that is very spare or keep things from getting too crazy. So it's almost like these two examples, I mean, they're not exactly opposites, but they kind of show two different ways. Patricia, which, what would you like to add? Um, I like the one in Walnut Creek that's just below a little bit, and um, let's see that that one right there. It has um, I like the wood on it um, and the mixed the mixed um, materials. I know there's something about that that looks like it would be not super expensive to build, but it has some nice features. Great. All right. 
then I'm going to keep scrolling. And, and of course, just chime in. We do have a few more minutes to kind of really look through all of these. So I'm just scrolling down because I know, for example, actually, Matt, one of the things you're saying for affordability, likely affordable projects may end up with some features in specific places, but then the rest of the building might be a little less um, decorated. So Patricia, what would you like to add? Or was that your hand up oh, before? Sorry, I forgot you. Okay, <laughs> Moonlight. Um, I, number 15, could you scroll yeah, back? Yeah, sure, I'll go back. That one I do not like. <laughs> okay, yes, let know us know why. We've all been polite and um, and which is and focusing on positive, which is wonderful. But I'm going to break tradition here. It just uh, the it just looks so bland and and to me just too um, uh, just not interesting at all and um, just generic um, and I, I'd almost. Maybe it's the I could be the color, but but it, I think the uniformity is just so. Uh, um, uh, I'm I'm not speaking well tonight or expressing myself. That's okay. <laughs> I to express my thoughts, but um, it just seems it just doesn't seem that funky vibe that Arcata tends to gravitate towards, and and uh, it just sort of it's just a little too stark and dry and unappealing and um so that that's just my my thoughts about that one thank you okay thanks for sharing your thoughts and matt so i i, I i'm assuming we're talking about the white building right because this is there's sort of two buildings featured here but the white building is the one that has the numbers going to it yeah well i think what the building is doing is it there's there's two parts of it and one might be recessed further back. It's hard to always kind of tell from these photographs exactly what's happening, but I'm assuming it is still part of the building, but it's kind of like behind and the white part. Yeah, so yeah. I think what's interesting about this one is I actually, I like the right side of this building, right? I think I, I really like the ground floor with the big windows and the columns and, and sticking out. And then I don't like the left side Mm -hmm. because you got this like long stretch of sort of unbroken i guess it's maybe wood or something and then there's these two little doors that look like fire escapes or something like like as like a person walking along you'd think like i'm not i'm not supposed to go in there right like um whereas the other one looks like very inviting and sort of more uh, you know like it would fit into a, a neighborhood great yeah that's helpful to hear okay and melody what do you think um, I was looking at number uh, 32. Um, okay, we'll keep about... Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm just jumping around. I, That's I, all right. I... And you know, you all get a, a breeze by some of these. And I know they some of these were in um, the presentation as well. So they hopefully there's some familiarity, but there's so many great examples. And actually, it's really helpful when you do say the number and you're like, what you like about it and the feedback, because then we're like, oh, specifically, I get it now. Okay, Melody, what do you think of 32? Um, yeah, so I, I'm glad someone started saying things that they didn't like, because I um, I think that's important too. Um, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the reflective art um, I think it can it can work. I, I I'm not opposed to um, art features in general. I think it can be nice, especially for um, different types of housing. But um, especially if it would you know increase costs, I don't think everyone's going to like the exact same style. And something about it being reflective, I can imagine, might be um, a little bit uh, distracting on like a sunny day or something, which might be the point of it. But um, I just thought I would bring that up. Yeah. Great. Um, Moonlight? Um, I, I noticed you had a picture of the Plaza Point in our, from Arcata, in fact. I was hoping we could look at that one real quick. Let's go back and... Is it? No, not bittersweet. Um, it ah, here we go. Okay. Well, maybe familiarity is just right there, but I really, really like that one. 
it uh, it just seems I like this the wide sidewalks. I know we're not focused on that today, but it just there's so much. Um, I just think it's just a really good example of something that has worked well, and it would be a nice. It's a, like a nice guinea pig template that that I'd I'd love to bounce off of that. As you know, there's colors and there's diversity, and it's kind of funky and it's. Um, it, it, it's got the retail down at the bottom and the sidewalks are wide and not obstructed too much. And it just, the, the roof lines are all different. It's just very, to me, I've always really, really liked that. Ex and I know I'm not the only one. Um, and so anyway, that, I just wanted to zero in on that one since we all see it all frequently. And, and I'm glad it's one of the options in your lookbook. Great. Yeah, that's really detailed and very helpful. Patricia? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll agree um, with Moonlight. And um, when you go, um, when you walk past all those little stores, um, there's a lot of small businesses kind of tucked in, but they have these big windows and they're very welcoming. And um, yeah, I like how it's broken up. Um, so they're almost like a bunch of little individual buildings together. And then also, I like, I think, it, we scrolled by it kind of fast, but just um, below it, the um, I like those in Scott Valley. Scott Valley. Mm -hmm. They kind of look like they're conjoined, but they're very, um, they're very individual. Um, mm -hmm. And it almost looks like it's mimicking um, row houses in like San Francisco or, you know, that, those small little Victorians. So I do like the, that design too. Great, that's really helpful. Um, let me just also, I think it's great that, um, let's see, I'm getting, oh yes, Matt. Yeah, if you if you scroll up so you can see 23 and 22, um, I've had a lot of people tell me about these two buildings. Okay. <laughs> um, and say that they like 23 and, and don't like 22. And the reasons I hear are color, right? And then also the roof. Uh, is a big one, right? That the 23 has the differentiated roof and then 22 is flatter. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, you know, those are two local buildings that everyone's familiar with. And I feel like the, the like everyone I've ever talked to has said they like 23 more than 22. So something. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I, I think um, variety is really what we are hearing a lot of. And then, um, and, you know, when we look at roof lines too, it's important to say, see if, you know, um, it applies to all cases. Here, it's really quite a nice variety and you do see a lot of variation. In others, you may not see as much variation, but sometimes, sometimes it can work. Um, it's just, what are those instances? So, um, but I wanna give Melody a chance to give more comment. I also like the Plaza Point apartments. I, I agree, like the different roofing style is really nice and um, the different colors. I see there's like a, some that have balconies as well. Um, and the, having the stores on the bottom is just so, so nice. And I think gives it a good look. So just wanted to uh, chime in with everyone else on that. Fantastic. Well, great. Um, so this is awesome. I'm just gonna keep scrolling because there's so many. And um, and then you can stop me whenever you like. We do have two other parts, but I'm going to make them less, a little more brief. So Patricia, do you want to add more? Um, yeah, you don't have to scroll back to it. Um, okay. I think um, all of us in Arcata are familiar with it, but the bittersweet building has always been, um, I really like how they did, um, they kind of almost remodeled that more than it's being a brand new building because um, they took kind of an industrial it was almost like a shed and then kind of made it funky and really kind of modern. And I, I just think they did a really good job with it. Great. Cool. All right. So I'm just keeping on going because there are so many ways that, and these are somewhat recent, these images that were chosen are somewhat recent. So they kind of show we're at the end here um, that we are showing that um, this is what people are typically building these days, but of course, you know, the the code is what helps guide and keep certain things from happening and encourages other stuff 
to happen. So as you look at this, yes, moonlight. Um, could we scroll back to number 30, or excuse me, 24? 24. 24. Sorry. Don't get too dizzy while I do this. All right. Here we go. 24, blue bonnet. Um, I like how um, the, it says garages access, um, let's see, garages access, access from behind the building. I, I'm wondering if they're, um, so that would mean any type of garage is, is, is it like a, it, that, to, that to me would, um, to have everyone going to their car in one place, as opposed to having individual slots like in 37 i think that would does that invite more uh community or seeing your neighbors more rather than driving into your allotted garage and just sort of um um you know disappearing i, I was just kind of comparing the the garage parts from the looks from 24 and 37 i was just wondering if when you have a more communal parking area you tend to see your neighbors more frequently or maybe i'm that's just a you know it's, it's a good thing to explore um when it, when the garage is in the back well in that scotts valley image you couldn't see it but it would be accessed from an alley in the back mm -hmm. and so there's absolutely still opportunity to see your neighbor but this is accessed from the street in this image and it's important to consider that we do consider that as well in our standards so um whether one works better than the other is some an opinion that we'd love to hear more about so I guess uh, yeah getting opportunities to encourage interaction with neighbors in these types of um structures i think are all, would be a real benefit okay uh, people just kind of disappearing into their world and 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 never seeing each other i don't know i'm just thinking of this for the first time so i, I don't even know what that looks like but it would be like a uh an af a, a affirmation or a uh aspiration you know where yeah oh i think of it as a really great design intent to try to get people to build community yeah so. design, i'll write that down design intent to build community thank you very much <laughs> right. right matt uh yeah um on the driveway parking garage thing i think i have a strong preference for not breaking up the street uh mm -hmm. with driveways you know that's going to have cars turning in and out all the time that, you know, that's that's not good for people walking. Uh, if you have to have parking, I'd much rather it be accessed via an alley, although I would have a strong preference for no parking. Uh, and then 38, which I think is right below this one. Um, I, I don't know why, but I really do not like this building. It sort of looks like a hotel or a McMansion almost. And I, I do not know enough about architecture to tell you why that is. Uh, but I will I will share my dislike for this this building style. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good to know. I mean, sometimes, yeah. If if something strikes you, you're like, it's the mm, do tell us. So, um, and Melody. Yes, I I also um, prefer uh, garages that are either more um, communal or towards. Uh, the back of the building because I, I also don't like, um, you know, breaking up the sidewalk with the garage. It can feel kind of dangerous walking around or, um, and uh, yeah, just, I think it would encourage more um, walking um, if there was, uh, yeah, you know, not, not a lot of car access around the front. Okay. Fantastic. Patricia. Um, yeah, I, I like um, I like it when there's not a lot of um, curb drops um, coming out um, just for bicycle safety reasons. Um, I also um, don't like the Nevada one mm -hmm. <laughs> for some reason. It looks like a very cheap Santa Barbara knockoff, but um, <laughs> not done well. I don't know. There's something that irritates me about it, too. And then also the one just above it, um, if like you remove the at the curb drops. Um, I kind of like the idea of having um, garden 
space, like the like building set back a little bit, and then some communal garden space for the residents, because then that really brings in a community interaction when you garden on the street and you can talk to people going by. And, and um, so I like how it's kind of pushed back a little bit, and there's that space with some gardens, and then, yeah, if you just put the parking in the back, that would be a great one. But I actually like the look of that, um, the one in Berkeley. Um, yeah, with just the access from, you know, from behind the buildings or a different, different parking area. Great. Thanks, Patricia. All right, Moonlight? Yeah, I agree with Matt and Patricia regarding 38, but could we go back to 38? I, I did sure. like one feature on it. I do like that private space for uh, ground floor outdoor patio space. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, that that's kind of a new feature I'm noticing in this one, as much as I don't like the, you know, McMansion hotel idea as well. But I do, you know, if you're in a wheelchair or you're not able to access stairs well and you end up having a ground floor, um, it, it I like that privacy of being able to hang out from your home on the ground floor and just enjoying the street because that would build community as well when people are walking by. Hmm. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I'm noticing on here, I think this one is also calling out some of the little special details like shutters or lintels or these sort of designs that are right underneath the windowsill. And and so it's it's um, got a lot of things that would check a box <laughs> in terms of like decoration. However, it seems to not totally pull it off. So it's always interesting to hear what's going on. All right, Matt. Well, just on that, I think you can go overboard with that sort of stuff. Right. And so like people don't want a totally blank wall with nothing interesting going on, but then there's also like a, we're trying too hard sort of look that this building has. And I don't know how to write that into a code. I'm giving you guys a hard job and I'm sorry. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're clear on that. Sometimes it's a little bit too much and, and a little bit too little. And so it's a tough thing to do. And now these days we have to write them objectively as well. So um, that means we have to provide numbers of like how much you need to add and and not do. So um, yeah, it is a hard job. <laughs> but your opinions really do help us focus what is really important to you. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, Patricia. I think uh, my my uh, personal feeling is um, design features that serve no purpose drive me nuts, like shutters that are just a detail, you know, but um, so if there were actually shutters that, you know, people could close and, and open mm -hmm. up their windows and have privacy but air, then, you know, the, that would be great. But yeah, things that, that don't are just kind of knickknacky um, and cluttery drive me nuts if, if, if it doesn't really enhance, you know, someone's, you know, uh, space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would have to say my husband, who's not a designer, agrees with you. He's like, what are, what's up with the shutters? <laughs> you know? So um, Moonlight? I, yeah, just to you know, belabor that, just functional, as I would say, over um, um, cosmetics would probably be a nice uh, direction or go, uh, goal, fun functionality, since as opposed to just... Uh, yeah, kind of like what everyone else was saying. Yeah. So I'm just going to go back. Well, you remember the Juliet balconies. I wanted to ask a little bit more about that because these are real balconies, but let's, when you're, and here's some real balconies, but what a Juliet balcony is, and I'm not going to find it right away, am I, um, is that there's sort of a, a, a decorative fence, Um that basically looks like a balcony. I think it was way yeah. at the beginning. So yeah. So maybe I won't find it, but if you can hard. imagine it, yeah. you know, that that's, um, is that something that we would want to get to the, that kind of detail to talk about? Like, is that important? Here's kind of a Juliet balcony. There's like not a surface to stand on, but are they still, are they still nice or useful or decorative and, and, and looks good? I don't know. Patricia, what do you think? I think if you could, if it allows you to open up a, 
big, huge window and, you know, and it be safe for kids and, and animals, then I could see it serving a purpose. But if I had, um, if I had an option, it would be great to have a covered, you know, patio, especially in Humboldt, um, mm-hmm. or balcony, I guess I should say. Um, but, um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, if it was a kind of a protection to be have a big, huge, operable window, that would be nice. But if it's just a detail, then yeah, it's kind of on the shutters list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just going to take a few more comments because I want to make sure we have some time to look at some of the other things too. Um, and and so, Moonlight, what would you like to add? Yeah, I agree with Patricia. I guess the when I, the first picture with the Juliet balcony was a corner mm-hmm. structure or building, and so I think that the corner that made that corner look softer, okay. and so maybe. But now bringing in the nuance of functionality, that's an interesting uh, new discussion. So, but I, 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 it, I, the corners obviously the corner buildings are going to be different then um and have a little extra things to include than the ones that are not corner lots but um okay you know those yeah. are distinctions yeah it, it, that's it, very uh intriguing to flush those two concepts out yeah actually corners are really something we always look at too because in some cases there's a priority frontage that really looks that's like the front and then what you do on the side is a whole other thing other times there's two really important streets and so how you address both streets is um also part of the need for design on on two sides of the building so um okay you you all did such a great job and <laughs> you know i i think the the level of comments i have to say uh surpassed what i expected and i i don't know what i was expecting really but really this is like a level of conversation we're always um looking forward to as architects so how this translates is um i want to pull up this this is one of the other materials um there's three total this is the memo that it includes um, a little bit of what is this is all going to become at the end of the project. And it's funny, you got to look at all the pretty pictures and now it's all going to be words. Um, but what we're doing is looking at facade articulation and, and the word intent is, um, it's not a, a surprise that I was using that because intent is where we're really talking about what the goal of this whole thing is anyway for the zoning and for facade articulation here the intent is to create a street facing building facade um, that is varied and interesting with human scale design details and we talked about a number of those those were fantastic and then also incorporate architectural elements that reduce the perceived mass and box like appearance of buildings Um, here this is just a big list um there's seven topics total but you know just to use the facade articulation since we talked about it so much um we i know we did contrasting materials in color we talked about windows but not particularly bay windows um wall modulations we didn't get into that a lot but like awnings canopies balconies so the whole list i won't read it all out but and we talked about juliet balconies those are on there but um you know, as in the feedback, if it's not now, it's okay. But in the feedback, if you see this list and you think there's something that's on it that um, shouldn't be on it, or if you're like, oh, don't forget about this, um, you know, let us know. Um, As you see it now, I think we did cover most of these. Um, Green walls would be vegetation on buildings, um, on the vertical walls of buildings. Um, What else? We did talk about art, projecting window frames. Yeah, so hopefully we're covering and we'll be going through the our feedback as well and looking through the list um, and making sure we're covering things. But if there's anything that's really like a passionate thing that you are like, you know, I've always kind of been looking for that in a building. Yeah, do, do let us know. Does anything come to mind? Yeah, Matt? I would express a, a preference for local artists to do the art on walls. 
Okay. That might be one of the things that everyone would agree is better if possible. Okay. Fantastic. Patricia? Um, I, yeah, I was going to say, um, I actually was going to say local artists too. Um, um, if we could focus on, you know, the, the local, um, artisans, especially with the gateway, or sorry, especially with the creamery, um, in the middle of the gateway. And then, um, I really like green walls. Um, and I'm assuming when you say green walls, it plant, you know, materials that go up walls if that's what that is. And then also like more natural materials kind of mixed in. So it kind of breaks up that concrete, you know, sterile look of, of um, you know, stucco or, you know, uh, or a lot of metal work, you know, a lot of times they do metal um, siding and stuff. So um, yeah, so I don't know if green walls means plant the living walls. Um, but yeah, I, portions yeah. of it, yes. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Patricia. All right, Melody. Yeah, I, I just want to also express a um, preference for local artists. I I am, um, yeah, I am kind of conscious about things like green walls and art um, being requirements, um, perhaps putting a little bit too much um, of an increased expense for some, uh, especially apartments. Um, but I think it would be good, you know, just to make sure like if that is a requirement, definitely um, make sure it's it's for local artists um, and also indigenous artists, I think would be really great to see um, uh, specifically people from, from Wiat or um, other tribes um, in the area. Fantastic. Um, so when these kinds of things are put out there, the, the, there's this huge list. They're not all requirements. Um, they're given a chance to choose which options to use. And so some of these things might be weighted more than others. But as you've expressed some that are really important to you, I think this is helpful to us. Others that I think um, are on there, some might be like, yeah, you have to have more than two colors or something like that. But um, they're not all requirements, but um, could be selected from a list. Moonlight? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was just thinking this was just an idea. I agree, local artists. And I'm wondering if there was a way to um, have a type of ability to have a canvas, a blank canvas, prepped and ready for a local artist to come and um, paint a mural and somehow it could tie into our Arcata arts plan. Yay, Dylan. Um, so, you know, just kind of, you know, our ASAP plan and, and um, you know, Parks and Rec Commission Committee could weigh in on that somehow, but, you know, have it sort of prepared and ready to go with that flat ability to paint. And, um, you know, that would be a nice uh, gift ultimately to to somehow include in in the in that structure. Fantastic, um, and I don't know what exists now, but that it's definitely something a lot of cities have done is really try to show their local character and colors through their murals. So um, I feel like. Why not? Um, I'm just gonna scroll through a few others for building entries. Um, I think that social interaction um, we were all talking about. So the intent is now, you know, that is really part of the intent of the of, of putting building entries um, in, in the project in, in close proximity to each other. The other is to support pedestrian oriented public realm. And I feel like we talked about that briefly with the with the driveways and really trying to keep the street um, undisturbed with curb cuts and things like that. So um, the proposal of what we're trying to do, there's a lot to read here and I, I, we won't belabor every single um, of the seven different ones, but we go through roof forms, windows and doors, ground floor frontages and so on. Um, but here, you know, some of them are 
you're starting to see some of the numbers that we're asking for, like at least one entrance for every 100 feet uh, for non-residential uses and every 200 feet for residential uses and that kind of thing. So require corner buildings to provide entrance onto both streets if they're on a corner um, and so on. So sometimes this takes a little longer to digest than one evening so i'm not going to make this a quiz but if there's other things especially about entries um that you feel like you just want to make sure we have in there now is a really great time to to say it yeah patricia um living in humble um recessed entries are always really nice something that um is you know you have a little bit of a roof or you know uh, a canopy above your head when you're like trying to pull off your sopping breath <laughs> is this recent experience <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah uh, yeah that makes sense life living in humble so like actually you know kind of a little bit of a recessed um ground floor would be nice okay fantastic yeah so well, plus one on this third bullet. I think it's a great thing. Yes, Moonlight? Yeah, and any up, I love that support a pedestrian oriented public realm with an attractive and welcoming. I noticed, I think it was actually that 38 image. I think it was that one where there was a tree planted, but it was away from the sidewalk. It wasn't in the sidewalk. It was kind of like a little triangle. You know, I love the street trees idea, but then it, interferes with the, the sidewalks so often. So, um, you know, supporting, and I'm sure most people, well, anyway, I, I know for myself, supporting the pedestrian oriented, you know, it, it is uh, it's safety and, and space so that somebody in a wheelchair and someone next to that person in the wheelchair can walk side by side. Um, that, that's, I always have shout out for that bullet point there for me. Okay, great. Um, awesome. So we'll go through, we won't go through these ones, but I'm just letting you know, roof forms, windows, there's quite a bit that you can also see. I always find it's helpful instead of just saying it's there, just to briefly look at it. Ground floor frontages for non-residential uses. So those are the, the, um, storefronts that are at the ground floor for mixed use buildings. And then materials and colors. This we could probably talk about all day long. So maybe we should pause on that. But then I'll just say garage entries and doors. And we did have a chance to talk. But materials and colors, I noticed um, we did like a variety. And in some places, there's some materials that are very encouraged and others that are prohibited. And I don't know if you have any um, opinions about what is not appropriate for this area or what is like kind of common and should be part of the character and used uh, more frequently. I don't know if there's um, any opinion about that. Moonlight. Uh, maybe durability for the weather that we have here would probably be very helpful. So it's a lower maintenance options. So things don't look too shabby quickly or moldy, mildew okay. or lichen, mossy. <laughs> All right. That makes sense. All right. Well, great. Um, this is also, you know, the feedback that we uh, put uh, that you can give online um, through the follow up survey. Uh, this, if you want to go into further detail and something catches your eye later, please do so. Our last piece that I just wanted to um, go over is the open space examples and oh, hold on. I don't feel like I'm at the beginning. These are the ones that um, show different kinds of open space and just wanted to get your thoughts and reactions about some of the different spaces. There's um, the ones that are um, privately owned, but 
open to the public, publicly accessible. Um, we'll talk about linear parks briefly, and then we'll also talk about a community square. So when we're looking at those, the examples that were provided were these ones. And I don't know if you have any um, like smaller parks that you think are really great and the kinds of features you would like in them, but um, that would be really helpful to hear if you have um, any guidance that you want to provide on what you think would be good in a privately owned park. Yeah, Matt. Um, so something that I think makes these work is that the people have to have like a reason to be there. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen examples of this where it's next to an office building or something where no one actually has a reason to like stand out. Like at the end of the workday, they just like go home, right? Mm -hmm. What you need is like a coffee shop or something connected to it that like gives people a reason to sort of linger in the park. Um, so that's, that's something that, think about again I'm, I'm giving you guys assignments that i don't know if they could be incorporated but like yeah in my mind i'm already thinking of the standard right. i'm like entrances <laughs> must face the park so like yeah if you, if, i guess if, if they wanted to actually be used by people it has to have like a reason because otherwise it can feel sort of like especially these privately owned ones can feel sort of like added on at the last minute um mm -hmm. and it, they can work really well i think if they are adjacent to a coffee shop or something that draws in people. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. Um, Melody. I really love the, um, the linear parks and the, the Westwood Greenway. Uh, sorry if this is like a completely different. Go section. ahead. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> but I, yeah, I just think they're, they're really great to like encourage, um, to encourage more uh, walking, biking and, um they uh yeah they just to me like encourage a lot of community and family um access which i think is great um and i think you know sort of connecting those to the to the privately owned um parks is is also a nice idea um just sort of making thinking about cohesively planning um, the gateway in a way where it's uh, it all fits together and just walking from place to place is really easy. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Um, Patricia, do you want to add more about linear parks or the privately owned parks? Um, well, both. Um, I, sure. I, I think uh, most people that know me in Arcata know that I'm um, definitely for linear parks, especially um, we're, kind of, we're kind of pushing for one along L Street. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I kind of think the more linear parks, the better, even if they have little small pocket linear parks. Um, the, my recent, well, I do a lot of trips down to San Francisco for UCS or UCSF. And there are a bunch of little linear parks that kind of interconnect with other ones. Um, and I really like that idea when someone who was talking about, I don't know who it was, sorry, I apologize, talking about um, smaller privately owned parks kind of opening up into a linear park. Um, that's a really neat idea because you can kind of like wander into a little pocket and then continue on on the linear park. Um, so I kind of like that idea. And then the other thing I noticed, I noticed um, gates on the Transamerica. Oh, yeah, here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so gates, I know um, Judith Mayer was our one of our planning commissioners was talking about um, there's always kind of a maybe a possibility that um, the private spaces would be closed off um, if things, you know, in the future. And so, yeah, gates with those little pocket parks are kind of um, maybe at night, maybe it's just for protection at night, but um, that's always kind of a concern that yeah, taken away at some point. So anyways, that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Okay. Um, I don't know. I see Melody's hand up. Right. Did you want to add more or no? Okay. I'm sorry. That was from, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Just wanted to check um, moonlight. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I'm i glad Patricia brought that up. I saw those fed the gate right away, too, and thought, ooh, red flag, personally. Um, I did like with the Linwood. So so as far as the gate, eh, yeah. Linwood, that would be, uh -huh. 
And, but the Linwood, I like how it's covered for, you could actually be there when it's raining or you can sit on the benches or where it's not, uh, where it's sunny. So the, I, there seems to be like a, several, two choices of visiting with, with uh, other folks in the community. Uh, I really do like that covered though. I know when I'm visiting outside with friends, I'm always thinking in this weather, especially these days, where can we go that's outside and covered? And there aren't that many options. So um, I like that very much. All right, good point. Um, wow, we're getting on to the end of the hour. Do you? I just wanna give everyone a chance. There's these two examples of a square and just wanted to hear if there's any opinions about um, a square in the Gateway area. Patricia? Um, I think um, Matt brought up a good point um, with parks. If uh, the square was incorporated in an area that would, you know, would be useful for that particular neighborhood, um, a square would be nice, but then we also live in Arcata, which has a phenomenal um, central, you know, square plaza area. So um, I don't know. I kind of think it might be a little unnecessary. Be I would rather see a park or more linear parks or, um, you know, uh, more trails with um, small little pocket parks along the trails um, than actually a square. Because I, or maybe like incorporate i you know if i would see a square in the gateway it would be really nice if it was closer to the creamery or like adjacent to the creamery um with the arts because they do so much arts and um, festivals and so um if it was kind of far away from that um then so yeah so it depends on where the location of the square is um yeah so anyway so those are my thoughts fantastic all right. Um, Moonlight, what do you think? Um, yeah, I agree with Patricia as far as your proximity to the creamery so that uh, activities that are arts related can sort of segue there easily. And but between the two of uh, the Copperopolis and the Oakland one, the, the thing I don't like about the Oakland is it doesn't seem like a place where people can gather. Well, what we have at the plaza now, maybe you're unfamiliar with the plaza, but we people can come and gather and there's a central circle area and it's it's um, you know, it's very conducive to a event. And what I'm seeing with the Oakland example, I don't see that as con as conducive to an event as opposed to the Copperopolis one. Um, so the, 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 um, Oakland one just seems a little cluttered almost where you wouldn't, it's, it's just sort of spilling all over nothing. Where would the band play kind of thing? So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just, that was just my first thought. Thank you. Yeah. Great. And Matt. Yeah. So the, the main difference I noticed between the two was the presence of cars. It actually looks like the other one was taken on a like a car show day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, There's our feature. Yeah. I, I personally would prefer a plaza without cars. I think it makes you feel safer. It allows you to walk around more. Um, I'm not saying I actually I also agree with what Moonlight just said about like the centrality of this one is sort of nice, but I think you could have that without the cars and it would sort of be the best of both worlds. Um I mean, the day that everyone uses our plaza the most is the day that we don't let cars park there, right? It's, <laughs> yeah, um, a good yeah. point. Uh, yeah. yeah, just something to think about. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. Real Patricia? quick, I yeah. just wanted to check in and, and see how your guys' group is doing. It sounds like you guys are on open space, so you are right yes. along the right time frame. We're wrapping up. How are you doing are we it, all supposed to get back together yeah about it sounds like maybe about 7 40 i have one group that's a little slower and has just started open space oh, okay um and i have one group that is ahead of you and has finished open space okay. so I, I, all my groups are on a little different time time frame so it sounds like you guys are getting close 7 40 yeah. sound okay to you yeah we'll we'll pop back in at 7 40 for sure and we'll keep going for now and then keep we'll, going yeah. keep going as long as you want i'm going to check back in with everybody in about 10 minutes how about that thanks okay thanks awesome all right patricia 
Oh, okay, I'll keep it quick. Um, I just think too of a lot of, I look at the other one in Oakland and see a lot of water runoff, not a lot of water retention. So I kind of like the natural, you know, the lawn and the grass, because you can do a lot with that with kids and, and festivals. And, you know, it looks like they're having an art fair car, car rally or something. But, um, but yeah, and I also agree it, it off of a main um, vehicle circulation route would be really nice. So it was just more pedestrian um, friendly. Okay, great. Uh, Melody? I'm not sure how this factors in, but if there is like um, a, a preference for um, less water intensive um, plants and, you know, native plants um, for the parks, that would be great to see too. Um, I agree with what somebody said earlier too, is that since we kind of, it's uh, Arcata is already so walkable, I don't think like a square is as necessary. I'd, I'd also like to see more um, uh, linear parks and um, more of the, the smaller uh, public gathering areas. And, but also, you know, if there was to be a, a, a square, uh, maybe just one that's smaller than the current plaza, um, because it's still nice to have like a variety of options to, um, you know, for reserve spaces for events. Um, but yeah. Great point. Moonlight? Well, I was just going to note, I note that there's someone named Glenn and Lori iPhone who's who's on our as a participant. Oh, really? Just invite them if they wanted to share any thoughts they had. I'm sorry, I missed this on the participants. So yeah, if you are on here and I'm just not seeing you, Glenn or Lori, um, feel free to chime in um, with any opinions you have. Okay, well, we have actually made it through all the material we were supposed to share with you. Um, if you'd like to stay on um, for the next five minutes and continue giving me your thoughts, we can always go back to either the lookbook or any of the design standards that we're proposing and talk further. Otherwise, I, you know, you could just take a five minute break as well and we could all meet at 740. So it's up to you. I will stay here and um, hang out until uh, it's time to go back. So feel free to stay if you want to share more. Otherwise, also um, take a break if you need it. <laughs> And thank you so much. I mean, seriously, you've um, filled several pages of notes and Gillian, you've done a great job and the feedback has been excellent. So thanks so much for your feedback. And thank you um, too. It was, it was really enjoyable. Great. I, this is what I geek out about. I really like design and it's, I'm like really excited that you all see it in, in this detailed way because not everyone touched, I don't think everyone has the, sees it, you know? So um, what I heard from you today is that you're really um, invested in looking carefully. So um, Arcata is really lucky to have you <laughs> and we're lucky to have your opinions. So thanks for coming. Cool. So um, hang out if you like, or yeah. I, I just wanted to mm -hmm. say, Jane, thank you very much. You, your instructions were very, very clear, and it, you provided a very safe place to express our authentic opinions. So I, I, to be honest, I was a little nervous about the <laughs> breakout. I've done a lot of these now and having several break, breakouts, and uh, this, was by far, this was a very enjoyable one. Maybe it's because there were so few participants I don't know, but I, or maybe my confidence has grown. I don't know, but uh, this was very pleasant and enjoyable and non-threatening. And, and so I, I, I commend you as a facilitator for that. And not Moonlight, that you're so great. Thank you. <laughs> it's really <laughs> kind of you. Well, truly they, and they've all been great, but this was especially enjoyable. So thank you very much, Jane. Well, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah. If we have to spend our precious evenings on this, I, I hope that it's worthwhile and fun and enjoyable. So thanks. Thanks so much. You're, you have a nice pace and the way you speak and, and it, it, it was just really um, uh, positive by far. Thank you again.
oh, you're the best. Thanks. <laughs> that made my day. So thank you very much. And these are sometimes um, like uh, they feel a little bit like the, what is it when you, you're on stage and you have to make it up the whole time? Um, like improv? Like improv. So sometimes it goes really well and other times you don't do that well. So <laughs> I felt like this, this was a very um, good group and you all kept, you know, expressing your opinions. So I'm glad we were able to get to a place where we could really just feel free to say what we wanted. To, um, so that's great. Thanks. All right. I think we're all back. Okay. Great. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you had a good discussion in your breakout room. And uh, I think what we're going to do now is just take a couple of minutes um, for the facilitators to summarize some of the major themes that uh, um, were discussed in their breakout rooms, just so that we can all hear it. We'll also be preparing summary notes of the breakout room discussion, so we can all look at those as well um, if we want to. Um, and then after we've sort of summarized major themes, I'll just remind everybody what the next steps are, and then um, we will uh, adjourn. So um, uh, how about I'll go first in terms of summarizing the major themes of my group. Um, we had a great group. Um, I think that there is a diversity of perspectives in our group on sort of the gateway plan overall, which was great, um, as well as uh, a variety of opinions on um, some of the specific uh, uh, building facade and roof um, design standards. I think one of one of the major kind of comments that came out that I found to be particularly interesting is some concern about a, a projects being able to all choose the same facade articulation standard, um, resulting in a uniform um, design of development within the gateway area, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid, um, and wanting there to be some sort of regulatory mechanism within the gateway code that could prevent that from happening. I thought that was an interesting discussion. Another thing that came up was wanting to find the right balance between um, uh, design standards to achieve quality design and the cost of requiring those standards. Costs both from a economic feasibility perspective of a developer, as well as from the perspective of a renter or an owner of those units. So wanting to find that balance um, uh, uh, with cost and quality. Um, and then we also had a, a discussion of the L Street and K Street question in the L Street Linear Park and whether that is relevant to um, the design standards that would be incorporated into the form-based code. So that's kind of a high-level summary of, um, of some of the things that we talked about in our group. So let's see. Uh, uh, Jane, do you want to go next? Sure. I, I first want to thank Matt, Melody, Moonlight, and Patricia for being so great in our group um, and giving all their opinions. Um, so we went through, we kind of scrolled through all the images so that we can kind of see and compare and, and stop when we thought there was something to say about them. And um, we also were talking a lot about the the variety and contrast and making sure there's there's something interesting. I think one of the things uh, that really stood out to me is um, uh, there was a lot of mention of what kind of character Arcata should have or this gateway area should have. And I love the the term funky vibe. So um, there were the things that kind of appealed um, had a certain look to them. And I think we'll go back through the notes that there, we were definitely calling out the numbers of the um, images. And um, some of them have a historic feel. Some of them look a little like the creamery building. 
Um, and they definitely have some sort of reference in terms of materiality or the the kind of um, maybe it's the shape or some some reference to what is there already, which I think is fantastic. We also did get to look at some of the other um, projects in a, in a more critical way too, and so we were um, we had some really good discussion about you know what's too crazy looking or what's too boring, um, and so uh, that was really helpful to hear. I think some of the things that were really desired are welcoming big windows, opportunities to have um, community building by putting entries near each other or or having those occasions where, you know, people are able to meet each other either next to their driveway or something like that. There was also um, discussion about what the sidewalk experience is like and, and the safety of that and the experience of having it um, you know, in a, in a, uh, unobstructed way as well. And so, we, um, that was fantastic as well. So, um, we did look at the building in terms of all its components, um, from looking at different roof styles and discussed colors and the different elements that are on them, sometimes pointing out that if they're useful, that's actually, or practical, those are the best kind of elements to have. Um, and you can go too far with all the decorations on them. So, um, I also would second that our group talked about the affordability or the the expense of the construction as well. Um, and we talked also about local art um, being a part of the projects. And um, if there was a public art that there could be local artists um, that uh, do uh, put their work on the buildings, that would be fantastic. Um, and then I think as we move to open spaces, um, we talked a lot about how linear parks are greatly desired. Um, and actually, this is a feature that's also important for buildings, but any kind of features that provide um, overhangs or weather um, protection, uh, those are always really fantastic too. So um, in, in the parks, um, in the smaller parks um, and along the trails, if there's places and they're all linked together, that would be fantastic. We did get a few comments that, you know, um, it's great to have a square, but there's there's the main square that's really nice. And, you know, maybe it's not exactly necessary um, to have a square. It's probably better to have a um, the trail and um, and with natural features and all of those things so you could um, walk around. But, um, you know, if there is a square, it's nice. If it was a little smaller than the big square and, and perhaps there's a pedestrian orientation to it as well. So um, that that's a little synopsis of what happened in our hour. We had a lot of fun looking at all the images and um, there were some great conversation. I'm sure I missed something, <laughs> but it's great. there it is, yeah. Thank you, Jane. That's wonderful. Okay. And then, so our third facilitator, our third group, do you want to provide a brief summary? Yeah. And I, and I, I facilitated this group. Um, we had a slight tech power outage for Courtney. So um, I took over and was happy to do that. Really appreciated all the conversation in our group as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, we got into the design features and some of the highlights. I am not going to be able to capture everything, I'm sure, but um, we're um, just thinking about ground level garages and not wanting those all in the front and safety of those as well as design. Um, just something to think about. Um, and then we did talk about different each of the balcony features and windows and varied group lines. And um, there was discussion of support for a lot of those types of features and allowing it to be varied um, and not all uniform. Um, we got into um, some of the entry types and the People did indicate they liked the idea of commercial along the ground floor and having that open and visible. Um, and um, the idea of cost also came up in our discussion and not wanting it to be, you know, if it's too costly, will developers build it? Um, and um, then one other theme was 
um, <clears throat> talking it, about the context and existing loca built, uh, locations of existing structures and how that fit into where new buildings could go and what type of features the new buildings could go could, would include, um, especially thinking about larger buildings and you know having windows, looking into smaller buildings. Um, and um, then we, and we got into the open space. Um, there was uh, support for a lot of those and the linear parks and um, features, including pavilions and gazebos and that would provide coverage from, from rain and then additional um, also landscaping um, was really like, we did talk about the idea of bringing in, you know, additional features to some of the open space, like native plant gardens and butterfly gardens, community gardens, um, and then other types of potential features um, that came up were potential um, children's play equipment and, you know, other types of exercise features like that. Um, and then art also, um, the idea of, there was an example from San Diego that had some of the more industrial type art, you know, features it looked like, and um, the trail in Eureka that has some of those types of art features as well was mentioned. So um, bringing in kind of industrial type features that fed into to the area. Um, David, anything else from my group that, that we missed, that I missed? Yeah, no, I think you covered it pretty well. Great. I think uh, the singing frogs is one of the favorite ones that I heard. Yep. The, the magic of the singing frogs. <laughs> in the existing wetlands along L Street. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thank you, Vanessa. And... Um, Thank you, all of you, for um, participating tonight, for uh, taking the evening to share your thoughts. Um, I said in my group, and I'll say it again to everyone, uh, your um, input is needed. It's important. Uh, we can't do it without you, um, and we really appreciate it. And so in terms of um, next steps, um, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have a survey. Uh, with the same content that we talked about tonight. If you have additional thoughts that you want to share, um, uh, we encourage you to use the survey to do that. Uh, the survey will close January 30th, so you have kind of a week and a half to do that if you want to. Uh, and then after that, there will be a planning commission work session on Saturday, February 11th, at which we will be sharing um, some more developed recommendations for standards related to the topics that we are talking about today, as well as building massing standards as well. So we encourage you to stay engaged and continue to participate um, as we move forward. And um, David, do, uh, would you like to uh, make some concluding remarks? Um, no, I don't have anything uh, major. I just wanted to thank everybody for you know taking the time out tonight and um, you know sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. I couldn't agree with them more that you know we are really hoping to have a, you know community design process uh, that allows folks to you know to weigh in on these decisions and to have a sense for you know what development might look like in the future. Um, so just uh, appreciations to you all and um, hope to see you at our next events, and um, we'll talk to you then. Great. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. See you soon.